morning. I'll call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's hearing of September 6, 2024. Um, today, we're continuing the hospital, hospital budget review, and we'll have a presentation <clears throat> from uh, staff, and then we will go through um, a number of hospitals that have been scheduled for uh, staff overview of their individual um, presentations, and we'll have an opportunity for public comment. And if board members uh, are interested in having discussion on any of the individual hospitals, we'll do that as well. Although we will make motions, we will have the deliberations and actual votes um, next week. And with that, I will turn it over to Ms. Barabee uh, for the staff presentation. Great, thank you so much. Um, and I'll be joined by a staff um, of, of um, a couple of different folks that so will be passing it around. I'm gonna just share the slides. Let me know if you can see that. All right. Um, so we'll dive right in. Um, so we'll first we'll start with some follow up from Wednesday. We have a couple of things that we thought would be helpful to clarify um, one correction um, to share, um, and then we'll dig into hospital specific um, details. We're going to run in order um, of the hospital budget hearings. We hope to get through. Um, you know, half the hospitals today and then the rest on Monday um, with, you know, possible discussion, but then really saving the vote and further discussion for next week. So I will pass this to Mark, who's going to take the first chunk of slides. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, I am going to walk you through a couple of uh, items. I, I don't expect any of this to take too long, but I just want to walk through a few basic principles and then we'll jump into some uh, language that we've prepared for proposed standard budget order conditions. Starting point, though, I just want to walk through statutory overview again for everybody. Um, when reviewing a hospital's budget, the board is guided by a number of statutory principles. We spoke about these at the beginning of August and went through them in some detail. Board members, I know, are very familiar with these, and I don't want to spend a lot of time reviewing information that the board already knows well. So what I'm going to do is just read out what these, these areas of statute are. If members of the public want to look at those while they're following along, they're welcome to. And then, of course, if the board has any questions about any of these while we're going through the process today, I have these all available and can pull them up if necessary. So with that in mind, when the board is reviewing a hospital's budget, it's guided by first its statutory and purpose and charge, which is at 18 VSA 9372. It's guided by its duty to regulate consistent with the principles for healthcare reform, uh, which is at 18 VSA 9371. It is guided by its obligation to establish budgets using the statutory considerations set forth for hospital budget review, which are at 18 VSA 9456, and which are in our, our rule, which is GMCB Rule 3. And finally, it uh, uses annual benchmarks, it establishes them, against which proposed budgets are evaluated. And that authority is granted to the board at 18 VSA 9456E, and the processes by which the board does so and obtains stakeholder engagement and establishes those benchmarks is at GMCB Rule 3.202 and with some more at, at 3.305. And go ahead to the next slide. My apologies, I lost the screen for a moment when I was trying to advance, so let's try that again. Here we go. All right. Brief process overview. The board is tasked with establishing hospital budgets that meet the state's objectives as described in statute. That's what we're looking at today. These regulatory objectives are uh, there, there are many of them, but consistently they tie back to some core concepts. And uh, really, this is more for members of the public than for the board, which looks at these individually. But just at a high level, those core concepts tie back to the need to increase access, 
to improve quality, to promote economic and efficient operation of the hospitals, and to balance healthcare needs of people in Vermont with the ability to pay for care. Each year, the board undergoes a process to define specific criteria for hospital for hospitals to meet. We call those benchmarks. And each year, hospitals bear the burden of justifying that the budgets they propose align with the state's regulatory objectives. Next slide, please. Okay, so with that brief overview finished, I do want to loop back around to suggested motion language from our discussion earlier this week. There was a comment from the board about the second item. These are these are motions, uh, template for motions to be used for each individual hospital budget. Um, the comment was about the use of the term change in charge, which we have used in the past in prior budget orders and in motions. So what I did was I went ahead and included that language back into item two. So the change is highlighted in yellow. Everything else in the motion remains the same. And the change now with, I'll just read item two, uh, reads as with, with uh, that the, the board will uh, move to approve a hospital's budget with modifications with FY25 commercial change in charge and negotiated rate growth capped at X percent over the FY24 approved commercial rate cap reduced from what the hospital requested with no commercial rate increase for any payer exceeding that amount. And if you go to the next uh, slide, uh, here's that language again in the suggested motion language for a motion to approve a budget as submitted. So the difference here is, is just the removal of language that is adjusting or modifying the um, NPR cap and uh, commercial items uh, that, that were supplied by the hospital. So there's uh, there's that language. We don't have to do anything with this language now, but you'll see this language come up again when we're looking at individual hospital budgets. And if there's any discussion necessary of this language at that point, we can certainly have it. Um, go ahead to the next slide, please. Okay, a few more small orders of business. I'm gonna talk about enforcement for a little bit. And then my last item after enforcement will be those standard conditions that I described earlier. So we are looking at potential enforcement both today and on Monday for some hospitals. And this is enforcement related to deviation from FY23 net patient revenue caps that the board established. So what I'd like to do for the purpose of both public comment and board deliberations is walk through the enforcement statute rules and policy so that we all have a clear understanding of how enforcement actions operate uh, within the GMCB's discretion. So as a starting point, we are talking about enforcement of hospital budget orders. And 18 VSA 9456 states that each hospital shall operate within the budget established under this section, which is the budget order established by the board. The statute also states that if a hospital violates a provision of the section, the board may order a hospital to either cease material violations of the subchapter or regulation or order issued pursuant to the subchapter or cease operating contrary to the budget established for the hospital under this section provided such a deviation from the budget as material and take such corrective measures as are necessary to remediate the violation or deviation and to carry out the purposes of the subchapter i'll point to two items here the first item is that those first two options that both start with the word cease are options that are designed to be applicable when a deviation or violation from a budget is occurring in the year within which the board is making a determination. So when we're looking at decisions for the board to make for a budget deviation or violation that has happened in the past, what we are talking about is taking a corrective measure that's necessary to remediate the violation. I also want to touch on a core concept in the statute. This touches on, I believe, a public comment we got earlier in the week um, about enforcement actions. Uh, I, I think I heard an enforcement action described as a penalty to hospitals. So I do just want to be very clear about this. The statute 
does not describe this kind of corrective measure as a penalty. There is language in the statute that refers to administrative penalties that the board may impose if a hospital willingly violates a, a part of um, 9456. But this is not th there's this is not the section that describes administrative penalties. So this section of the statute, this enforcement section, is designed to correct a deviation from a budget order. It's designed to be a, be a corrective measure action. It is not punitive. It is not a penalty. Um, so I, I just want to be really clear about that. Um, I, I know that board members know this, but just for the sake of making the public record really clear on, on that point. So we can go ahead to the, the next slide, please. Along with the enforcement subsection in statute, there is also a subsection 9456F that concerns the board's discretionary authority to approve a hospital's application to adjust its budget. That section states that the board may, upon application, adjust a budget established under the section upon a showing of need based on exceptional or unforeseen circumstances in accordance with the criteria and processes established under section 9405 of this title, which is title 18. Two notes on this also. Note one is that applications from hospitals to adjust a budget uh, are applications that need to show that the hospital has had a need for the adjustment based on exceptional or unforeseen circumstances. We did get applications for budget adjustment from uh, Rutland Regional Medical Center, from UVMMC, and from uh, Porter Hospital. The applications are all applications to retroactively adjust FY23 budget orders, which in effect would null the need for the board or or you know it, it would be it would be a different decision of the board to adjust a budget retroactively than to enforce a budget that um uh from from fy23 so those applications have been made we have three of them and the board's decision to do so is discretionary uh that that is clearly outlined in statute if the board does decide that it wants to adjust a budget then it would need to find a showing of need based on exceptional or unforeseen circumstances. But if the board were to make such a finding, it need not adjust the budget. If there are any questions about that, happy to, to talk about that later. Um, okay, next slide, please. All right, moving to our rule on enforcement, we have a rule that describes the process by which the board reviews and considers a hospital's deviation from a budget order. Here's what it says. It says that before enforcing or adjusting a budget, the board must determine if a hospital's performance has differed substantially from its budget. And to do so, the board must consider the following. One, the variability of a hospital's actual revenues, taking into account the resources of payers and the methods of payment used by the payers. Two, the hospital's ability to limit services to meet its budget, consistent with its obligations to provide appropriate care for all patients. Three, the financial position of the hospital in relation to other hospitals and to the healthcare system as a whole, using the statistics developed from information submitted in compliance with the Uniform Reporting Manual. Four, the hospital's performance under budgets identified or established under subchapter seven of chapter 221 of title 18 of Vermont statutes annotated, those are hospital budgets for previous three years and its budget projections for the next three years. And five, any other considerations deemed appropriate by the board, including but not limited to other instances in which a hospital has less than full control over the expenditures limited by the budget. Next slide, please. In addition to the rule, the GMCB has a specific policy on hospital budget enforcement for overages or deviations of net patient revenue. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about enforcement today. And on Monday, we're talking about FY23 overages in net patient revenue. 
So I'm going to give a little bit of background on this policy. And as with the other sections of statute that I've referenced, if the board needs to look at these later for reference, uh, we can pull them up. I think a lot of these are old news, but, but just to say it. So policy on hospital budget enforcement. The board adopted this policy in 2021 to provide hospitals notice and guidance about the board's intent to enforce net patient revenue caps. The policy was implemented because some hospitals were exceeding these caps, which resulted in unanticipated commercial costs. Prior to this policy, the board found that no meaningful regulatory action was being taken in these circumstances. So the purpose of this policy was to clarify that action that hospitals could expect action to be taken and that the board would be out would outline in this policy the, the review methods that it would use. Um, the policy states that a deviation greater than 1% from the net patient revenue cap may cause the GMCB to take enforcement action under rule 3.401C. And uh, to be clear, the deviation greater than 1% is the trigger by which the GMCB will review a budget to decide if it takes enforcement action. The 1% is not described in the policy as a, a grace figure, uh, uh, meaning the GMCB is not ignoring the 1% overage and then only enforcing after 1%. It is, it is only reviewing budgets that exceed by 1% to give hospitals some wiggle room between budgeted and actuals. And next slide, please. So just to loop us around to rule 3.401C, which is the uh, enforcement rule, after determining that a hospital's performance has differed substantially from its budget, the board may adjust its budget by any of the following. One, changing hospital rates or prices by the amount of net revenues exceeding the budgeted net revenues. Two, changing the net revenue and or expenditure levels of future budgets. Three, allowing hospital rates to be increased for a hospital with a deficit caused by revenues that were less than projected, but whose actual expenditures were within the budget limits. Four, allowing a hospital to retain surplus funds if the surplus was achieved while the hospital stayed within its established budget. Five, allowing a hospital to retain a percentage of surplus generated primarily by volume in excess of that projected for a particular year, or six, any other circumstance the board deems appropriate. All right, next slide, please. So that gets us finally to standard budget conditions. Um, I'm going to just say at the top, we have set uh, standard budget conditions in the past, but I'm, I'll just explain what they are. Um, these are proposals for standard budget conditions that would be included with every hospital budget order that we issue on or before October 1st. So for each hospital, in addition to the NPR cap set by the board, the commercial change in charge and negotiated rate cap set by the board, and any other specific uh, conditions to that hospital set by the board, these standard budget conditions would be applied to every hospital budget order as well. So these apply to all hospitals. I'm going to read through them. There are a couple of slides on these, but I'm going through each item individually so that if there's any concern about in the items that are in here, hospitals have, have clear explanation or, or, or statement of it, and they can, they can think through it and, and offer any public comment they wish to. Starting with one. Hospitals FY25 NPR budget is approved at a growth rate of not more than X percent over its FY24 budget with a total NPR of not more than X percent or X dollars, excuse me, for FY25. Two, hospitals total commercial change in charge and negotiated rate increases are approved at not more than X percent over current approved levels with no commercial change in charge or negotiated rate increase for any payer at more than X percent over current approved levels. Actual FY25 commercial growth may be less than that amount, but under no circumstances may it exceed that amount. Three, hospitals expected commercial NPR based on its budget as adjusted in this order is X dollars. Hospitals shall report its actual expected commercial NPR not later than March 15th, 2025, 
or such later date as specified by the Director of Health Systems Finance and explain any variations from the expected commercial NPR. Item four, hospital shall file an updated rate decomposition sheet with the board no more than 30 days after its FY25 contracts have been finalized with commercial payers. Next slide, please. Five, beginning on or before November 20th, 2024, and every month thereafter, the hospital shall file with the board the actual year-to-date FY25 operating results as of the end of the prior month. The report shall be in a form and manner as prescribed by GMCB staff. Six, on or before January 31, 2025, Hospital shall file with the board in a form and manner prescribed by GMCB staff such information as the board determines necessary to review the hospital's FY24 actual operating results. Seven, hospital shall file with the board one copy of its FY24 audited financial statements and associated management letters, as well as the parent organization's audited consolidated financial statements, if applicable, 15 days after the hospital receives its statements or by January 31st, 2025, whichever is earlier. Eight, hospital shall file with the board its actual year-to-date FY24 operating results on April 30th, 2025 for October 1, 2024 through March 31, 2025. The report shall be in a form and manner as prescribed by GMCB staff. Nine, Hospital shall participate in check-ins to be scheduled at the discretion of the Director of Health Systems Finance based on, on the hospital's FY25 year-to-date operating performance. Next slide, please. 10. Beginning on or before November 20th, 2024, hospital shall include with each year-to-date monthly report a letter, if applicable, identifying any material changes to its FY25 budgeted revenues and expenses, or to the assumptions used in determining its budget, including A, changes in Medicaid, Medicare, or commercial reimbursement, B, additions or reductions in programs or services to patients, and C, any other event that could materially change the approved NPR or FPP budget. 11. Hospital shall develop and maintain a system to be able to measure and report to the GMCB the referral lag and the visit lag for each hospital-owned primary and specialty care practice, as well as the top five most frequent imaging procedures. Referral lag means the percentage of appointments scheduled within three business days of referral, percentage of all referrals where the clinic or hospital has completed scheduling an appointment within three business days of receiving the referral, regardless of the date on which the appointment will take place. Visit lag means the percentage of new patient appointments scheduled for the patient to be seen within two weeks, one month, three months, and six months of their scheduling date. The scheduling date is the date the hospital or practice schedules the appointment, not the date the referral was received or the date the patient will be seen. 11A, hospital shall report to the GMCB the referral lag and the visit lag for each hospital-owned primary and specialty care practice, as well as the top five most frequent imaging procedures on April 30th, 2025 for February and March 2025, and as required by the GMCB's FY26 hospital budget guidance. Next slide, please. All right, last one. 12. Hospitals shall participate in the board's work, including the community engagement process pursuant to Act 167. 13. Hospitals shall timely file all forms and information required for practice acquisitions and or transfers as determined by GMCB staff, if applicable. 14. Hospitals shall file all requested data and other information in a timely and accurate manner. 15. Hospital shall report on any changes it makes to the methods it uses to calculate information it reports to the GMCB. Any such report shall include a detailed explanation as to the reason for the change and the inclusion of a comparison report that shows the results using the hospital's prior method of calculation. 16. After notice and an opportunity to be heard, the GMCB may amend the provisions contained herein and issue an amended order consistent with its authority as set forth in 18 VSA Chapter 220, Subchapter 1, 18 VSA Ch Chapter 221, sub Subchapter 7, and GMCB Rule 3. 17. All materials required above shall be provided electronically unless doing so is not practicable, as determined by the Director of Health Systems Finance. And 18. The findings and orders contained in this decision do not constrain the board's decisions in future hospital budget reviews, future certificate of need reviews, or any other future regulatory or policy decisions. Next slide, please. Okay, so 
So what I have here is suggested motion language for standard budget conditions. The um, board is not voting on standard budget conditions today, but the motion language is here so that the board can take up this language with any modifications if it desires and open this for public comment before the board votes later next week. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to you, Chair Foster. Um, thank you. Can you go to the next slide? OK, um, why don't we stop there? It seems like a logical place to take a short break for any board comment <clears throat> or discussion. Um, any board members have any comments or questions for the staff at this point? I have a couple. Um, is it possible to get the change, any changes in the standard conditions from last year, either track changes or whatever's easiest? Yeah, that is possible. Um, there are a few, but not many. And the way we could do that is um, I can provide them to the board and then we can include them uh, in slides for Monday so that um, everybody has the same uh, clarity on what items are a deviation from prior year. Thanks. Or if, if it's easier to just say, look at conditions one, three, and five, that's fine too. I, I just, uh, it will save me some time if I don't have to do a word for word comparison. Happy to do that. Thank you. Um, on the enforcement policy from 2021, that was not the first enforcement policy the board had indicated, had adopted. And I'm wondering, um, I think, for example, the language about prior enforcement may have been in the earlier policy as well. So I'm just curious if we have access to the prior versions just to kind of get a sense of, it's been a while since we've had enforcement due to the pandemic. So just trying to get a little, for me, remembering uh, some of the past actions would be helpful. So I don't know if that's available. It may not be easy to find. So I just thought I'd ask. For example, I found the 14 to 16 policy, which has some similar language in it, but I haven't actually looked for anything from fiscal year 26, 17 on. Any other board member questions or comments? Great. I'll just turn to the help. Quick question. Um, is there going to, if if we would like to consider modifications to the standard conditions, is that um, best to discuss now or should we um, shoot an email, like uh, do this on Monday? What's the sort of process for that? I have I just one thought on. On, on one of the conditions. So the, um, I think that there, there are two options right now, both would be fine. Uh, one is that the board takes up the motion and discusses any potential modifications. We would table the motion for today, meaning you wouldn't vote on it today. Um, public would have the opportunity to give comment and then the board could pick up the motion again adding modifications is necessary later next week. Um, other option is that we could just look at these today, take time to, to bring them in, and then I can pull them back up on Monday morning and the board could uh, move forward with suggested motion language from there with any you know, small modifications that we might make. Any other board member questions or comments for their staff? Okay, I'll turn to the healthcare advocate. Good morning. Can folks hear me okay? Yeah, good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm, as you can see, I'm not Mike. Mike's with his family. Um, so I'll do my, I'm not Mike. So I'll do my best um, and I'll, I'll do my best to be brief as well. Um, 
first, I want to thank the board staff, the board, and really everyone who's dedicated to helping prevent pricing more people out of the care that they need. Um, and just on the recommendations, I want to say that the staff, what, what the board is considering, they're well reasoned and well informed by the reality that our healthcare system is in crisis. Um, but our office were concerned that the recommendations do not go far enough to address the affordability crisis that we think is poised to get a lot worse. Once the recent approved insurance rates go into effect and federal subsidies potentially expire. The HCA continues to believe that the board must employ its provider rate setting authority as a necessary tool to improve affordability for Vermonters and provide predictability for providers. In our view, regulation must be calibrated to match the scope of the problem. To us, one of the biggest problems that we see is that many of Vermont's hospitals are overpriced. The evidence that was presented and discussed at the hearings this past month and last year make that quite clear. Hospitals, like any industry in our view, like predictability. I like predictability. Applying a price ceiling like the sixth decile of RAND standardized price, in our view, would provide a needed and necessary constraint that we think hospitals can and would work within by becoming more productive, more efficient, and collaborative to meet the unique needs of their communities. It's also aligned with the concept of global budgets, whether or not Vermont decides to go with the AHEAD model. We don't think that such a price ceiling is unduly harsh. Setting prices at this level would mean that Vermont's prices would still be higher than 60% of the country. We also recognize that the application of a price ceiling would be challenging for our hospital system. And if the board does not move in this direction this year, we call on you to work now to take all the necessary steps to be ready to employ a strategy like that for next year and forthcoming years. Regarding Act 119, we encourage the board to require a ratio of bad debt to free care of 1.5 to 1 in its budget orders this year. We also call on the board to use its enforcement authority that was well described previously to correct any potential variance between budgeted and actual bad debt and free care in FY25. We think that this recommendation is well aligned with the enforcement action that the board is currently contemplating with respect to budgetary overages in FY23 for some hospitals. There, in our view, there is a broad range of how hospitals discuss the task of working with people that need financial support. Some seem to recognize the challenges and have reasonably stepped up to the task. Others express frustration that patients often do not want to collaborate with them to receive financial assistance. At our office, as you all know, I think we run a helpline and work daily with people who have challenges with their healthcare system. While the vast majority of people that we work with are appreciative and eager to collaborate with us, some people are indeed challenging to help. But in our view, those are often the people that most need it. Whether you run a hospital financial assistance office or a healthcare helpline, when we encounter someone who's having a hard time accessing our systems, the first thing to ask is what is wrong with the system? Are the written materials at a reading level that people can actually access? Do our helpers treat people with respect and with dignity? Are we framing the help in offensive terms, such as charity care, rather than price concession or assistance or support? While we're always available to help answer questions from hospitals about how to comply with Act 119, we believe that hospitals should have what the resources that they need to comply with the law. We're going to be pivoting from being proactive to being available to hospitals to answer questions and provide support about how to better help people access care. We therefore call on the board to do what you can to enforce compliance with Act 119 and require hospitals to achieve a better ratio of bad debt and free care. As was outlined in the presentation just now, we believe that these actions are well within the board's enforcement authority. Thanks for the time and thanks for everything that you do. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for those comments. Um, I'll open it up to public comment and then we'll move on to um, the rest of the presentation if there's any public comment at this time. And I'll just note that on the conditions and the motion language, if there's public comment, since we're not actually voting today, we can receive it um, other than today, if people would like, but I'll open it up. Okay. 
Great. Um, we will continue and I'll turn it back to Ms. Barabee. Um, so this is a slide that um, we had in the presentation earlier this week where we talked about the impact of price and volume on affordability. Um, I just wanted to spend some time explaining the various definition of price or commercial rate um, that have been thrown around, so make sure we're all on the same page. Um, so these are selected standard definitions of rate and price. Um, some of you, this is very well known others it's still kind of challenging to get a grasp of the differences so i just want to read these um, so we can all kind of have a shared understanding of what we're talking about so the charge or a change in charge or the charge master these are all referring to the amount a hospital sets for services provided to the patient before any insurance discounts so it's similar to a sticker price and it's usually not the final amount paid and this is usually pertains to a particular item and the charge master or, or a service um, the allowed amount is similarly at the service level. This is the amount that is to be paid between the insurance and the patient for the service to the hospital. So it's the list price or the charge, less any contractual adjustments. Um, so if you had, for example, $26,600, so your allowed amount, so they'd get $1,000 from the patient and $25,600 from insurance. The commercial effective rate that has been used in previous years for the regulation of some hospitals is really the growth in com commercial net patient revenue inclusive of price and volume. And I'll explain why this is defined in that way on the next several slides. The commercial negotiated rate, which we're trying to get clearer instead of just using the word commercial rate, which I think is confusing folks, is really how we've tried to separate price and volume, particularly in this year in the rate decomposition workbook, and is about the growth in commercial net patient revenue due to price. So it's due to the reimbursement amounts, the allowed amounts actually changed year to year. Uh, so this is an excerpt, um, an example, a commercial effective rate. I believe it's the network hospitals um, that have this um, metric that they've been using um, over time until last year. Um, so just to be really clear how this works is, you know, they explain how they arrive at the 13.45%. I believe this is from 2024. Um, so this would be a commercial effective rate that is based on what their cost inflation is. So their growth in total expenditures, less some offsetting revenue from pharmacy, less the increase in the assumed increase in public payer spending from Medicare, Medicaid, and other changes. Impact on bad debt and charity care. So those are again assumptions. Um, and then they come up with a number that is required in aggregate for commercial funding. That is then allocated out um, in terms of the commercial rate and that is the 13.68. Um, and then there's some other adjustments at the bottom. So this is a total revenue amount and it's a percentage associated with that total revenue amount. So I'll turn this back to Mark, but I just wanna be clear when we're talking about the commercial effective rate versus a commercial rate or a commercial negotiated rate, these are not the same concept and they're also distinct from charges, which is before the, negoti before the negotiations happen. And then what we're talking about in the workbook and the rate that we have been comparing to the guidance as it was set out in guidance is this negotiated rate. Um, so I'll turn it to Mark to walk us through this part. Yeah, and um, and this part is actually quite brief. This is just us pulling up that motion language again with the context of the uh, definitions that Elena provided. We wanted to give you first the change, which was that highlighted section in, in yellow. And uh, now we, we have the the motion language here. So you can just go ahead to the next slide, Elena. Okay, great. Um, and then I wanted to highlight a correction that we needed to make. There was a um, error in my spreadsheet. Um, and so the Rutland Regional Medical Center um, was actually 11 million. I think we had 12 million in the spreadsheet. So this is the amount subject to enforcement. Um, so the amount over budget um, in 2023. So this was a slide from Wednesday. I wanted to draw your attention to that and indicate that it's been corrected. 
I think you also asked for the impact of staff recommendations on days cash on hand. Um, we can't. I mean, we can do some sensitivity analysis on operating expenses, but this really depends on kind of how hospitals respond or if we decide to set caps on um, operating expense, which I don't think we've um, explicitly recommended, but it might be warranted if we're concerned about financial health um, of hospitals and being more explicit about the kinds of cost savings we want to see. Um, but this is just a sensitivity analysis. The assumptions are on the right. That helps you understand, assuming the operating expense is reduced from the submitted commensurate with the new approved NPR um, in option A, assuming that the operating revenue is same as the submitted budget. We know there's some variation in there as well. Assuming for the cash component of days cash on hand, in, which is the numerator, and, this, and submitted net revenue is deducted from cash investments and then model net revenue was added. So this is kind of walking out the different scenarios based on the assumptions of what happens with operating expenses and operating revenue, what their days cash on hand, how it would be impacted. So you can see option A, um, is, you know, everyone's kind of kept whole for the most part or improved in position if they're able to manage their expenses. Option B is really if they continue to spend at the same level that is included in their budget. So if we don't take a reduced operating expense commensurate with NPR, that would be problematic. But in some cases, you know, it wouldn't, you know, it just depends on which hospital it is. But expenses are a major component and something that we need to control at the same time that we're controlling our revenue growth. So this was asked for. We have it here. There's probably other ways to model it, but this we thought was gives you kind of a range of understanding the impact. Any questions on that? No, but but thank you for doing that. Okay. And I think we're, I think we accidentally deleted a slide, but we're gonna um, switch now. I think I'm gonna have the team help me present um, our next series of slides. So we're gonna dive into the hospital specific um, analyses. Okay, Emma, are you first up? Yep, thanks, Elena. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Emma Renya. I'm a health policy analyst here at the board, and I'm gonna start us off today by talking about Southwestern Vermont Medical Center. Uh, before I dive in, I do want to address the fact that this is the first hospital and there's a lot of information in these slides, so I'm going to try to go pretty slowly and I'd encourage members of the board to ask questions because these slides repeat for every single hospital. Um, so if there's something that's not clear, you don't understand, please interrupt and, and ask questions. Um, so we're going to begin with compliance, uh, noting that our submission process was New this year, there were a lot of changes. We released some items later than usual. Hospitals had trouble with the workbook. Others um, had trouble with the new requirements. This process took time. No one was perfect, us included. And so we're generally going to only mention compliance for hospitals that were later than most and for specific reasons. So for SVMC, uh, they notified us in mid-July that they needed to request a higher rate due to an inability to negotiate a higher Medicare reimbursement rate. So their budget was submitted to us on July 24th. Next slide, Elena. So looking at their benchmarks, what we see is that for uh, SVMC, they came in at the benchmark for NPR at 3.5%. For commercial rate growth, when they had to resubmit their budget, they came in just over at 3.5% when the uh, benchmark was 3.4%. So we're looking at that as a percentage of the system over guidance. They actually both end up being about zero. So being right at the benchmark for NPR, they're obviously at zero. And then their request over was so little for commercial rate that they actually ended up being just over 0%. Um, and then for their operating margin, they submitted 1.6%, which constitutes 4% of the system. So now we're going to talk about their justifications. We want to be really clear here that these are the hospital's justifications, not ours, and that these are also only their core justifications. There are likely others, but these were the main ones that we pulled from both their narrative and their presentation to the board. So first, they argue that they're a low-cost provider, and secondly, they argue that they've made significant progress in cutting expenses. Specifically, in their presentation, they argue that they cut admin expense from 18.1% to 17.4%, and then in their narrative, they say that they argue they argue that they have decreased admin salaries by 1.6 percent. 
there's a lot going on here, so we're gonna take it uh, pretty slowly and we're gonna start on the left side with this graph. So overall, what we're looking at here are the NPR slash FPP, I'm just gonna say NPR for ease, um, split out by pair. So that top dark blue line is commercial. So we can see that it's risen pretty steadily from 2018 actuals to 25 budgeted, going from 78.5 million to 112.7 million. The green line below is Medicare, uh, which we see it's also increased, though definitely not at the same pace and, and also not quite as linearly. They've increased from 62.7 million to 75.8 million. And then the third lighter blue line is Medicaid. So this has increased from 18.9 million to 22.1 million. So definitely a smaller increase and, and something that we anticipate. Uh, this chart on the right includes growth from the budget. So this is also split by pair and, and it's for NPR. We've got budget to prior year budget growth actual to prior year actual growth and budget to prior year actual growth. There's a lot of information on this slide and it's primarily for your reference if anyone wants to look at specific numbers. But if we go to the next slide, we've got a better graph that's a little bit more digestible. So here we're just looking at actuals versus budgeted NPR. So looking at the negative values, these reflect over budgeted revenues because their actuals came in less than budget, whereas the positive values indicate that they under budgeted because and their actuals exceeded their budgeted expectations. So what we note from here is that their commercial has continued to grow year over year um, and also that they are consistently less than budget. So we see a lot more red than black for the first line, that commercial line, kind of ignoring 2020 just because of the circumstances of that year. Um, but they're consistently coming in and over budgeting their commercial and not actually realizing that. Whereas for Medicaid and Medicare, their public payers, it's quite the opposite. They're more often than not uh, under budgeting. Um, and so they could get, they are always or almost every year, they're getting more money from Medicaid and Medicare than they're budgeting for, which means that money could be included and also we could take less money from commercial payers essentially. So because they're under budgeting Medicaid and Medicare, they're requesting higher commercial rates that they likely don't need. Hey, Emma, sorry to butt in. Um, since this is the first time we're running through all these slides and they're they're quite dense, do we want to take time for board questions on on some of them? Or Yeah, I mean, the board members are think? definitely free to interrupt at any time. So if there's any questions, I feel free to to jump in. Okay. I'm okay, I'm okay waiting till you till you get through it just because there's sure. quite a bit to get through. If yeah, people no feel otherwise, that's fine. But this is very helpful. Keep going. It's great. Thank you. Yeah. So for SUMZ for their change in charge, that's the primary thing we're looking at here. Um it's their history. So of course, before this year we were largely looking at change in charge. So what we see for SVMC is that from 2018 to about 2021, it's pretty stable, right around 3%. But we see a pretty stark increase from 22 to 24. Um, and this is something that's pretty common we see throughout the hospitals. And it uh, relates back to one of the slides we looked at on Wednesday, where we saw that from 22 to 24, there were pretty large increases uh, overall in the system, especially compared to pre-COVID. So the overall, that's kind of what we're taking from this slide is just that the charges have continued to increase and increase, especially from 22 to 24. All right, there's a lot going on in the slide, so we're definitely gonna take this one slowly. Um, on the left, we see operating expense. So those light blue bars are the actuals. And then the blue line is the year over year growth for SCMC. And the orange line is the Vermont average total of the year over year growth. So what we see is that SVMC has had a downward trend uh, year over year growth since 2022, and they've successfully kept it under the state of Vermont's overall rate of growth as well. And then looking at the graph on the right, this is essentially trying to capture the bulk of their operating expenses for each hospital. So this graph is gonna look different for every hospital because some uh, are more specific and give us more, some just give you know labor versus non-labor. So each one's gonna look a little different, but for SVMC, we have labor, uh, doing about 60% and looking specifically at 2025 budgeted, other non-salary expense at 23% and pharmaceuticals at 9%. Then from that table below, what we can see is that over the last three years, SVMC has underestimated their labor expense, but their gap between budget and actual has narrowed each year. So we see in 2022, that was a 4.3% overage, and then we're down to a 0.8% in 2024. Then underneath the labor, we have their non-salary expense, which again is their second largest bucket. So looking at that, 
Items that may fall into this bucket include IT and communications, medical and surgical supplies, uh, purchase services, which could include their professional service agreement with Dartmouth, where they're able to lease back physicians through them. And then their pharmaceuticals reporting began in 24, so that's a really important note here. It's not that their pharmaceuticals went from zero to 9%, they just began reporting in 2024. And so those come in just under 10%. And then looking specifically at labor, what we can see is that from their clinical and non-clinical budgeted split, it's about 75% clinical versus 25% non-clinical. And for the additional FTEs that they're hiring, they're hiring four clinical or they're looking to change four clinical uh, FTEs and one non-clinical, which is keeping up right around with their rate of 79% clinical, 21% non-clinical. Unfortunately, FCM SVMC did not split this out by department, so we can't really look at specific um, changes within their departments for the reporting. So we can look at the instead of their narrative. So their budget assumes contracted labor expenses in three hard-to-fill clinical areas. So this includes one FTE respiratory therapist, one in ultrasound and one in oncology. Uh, they also noted that in FY24, it was necessary to use contract labor in CT scan and nuclear medicine, but they've now recruited staff for these positions in FY25, which is great. There will be an additional uh, or addition of new FTE nurses budget to budget, and this is primarily through their nursing pipeline grant. And finally, SVMC was able to reduce two senior executive positions for FY25 through their collaboration with Dartmouth, and this will save them about $600,000 annually. So then kind of tying all these together and looking at operating margin growth, again, another busy slide, so we'll take it kind of step by step. Uh, the dark blue bars here are the SAMC budgeted values, whereas the light blue are their actuals. Again, the blue line indicates their uh, mar margin, just because I know we typically think of margin in percentages. And then the Vermont uh, average total operating actual margin is in the orange. So what we see from this is that in 22 and 23, they fell short of their operating margin budget. Uh, this was a pretty common theme for all hospitals in 22. You can see that SUMC actually outperformed the Vermont average with their 22 operating margin being negative 0.2% and the Vermont average being negative 1.8%. But every year since then, they've come in below the Vermont average. Uh, they point to their 1% operating margin projected for FY24 and their 1.6% budgeted for FY25 as working towards their 25 theme of financial recovery and their goal in future years is a 3% operating margin, which we've seen uh, kind of stated across multiple hospitals of getting back to that pre-COVID ideal. Going over to the right, oh, sorry, Lena, can you go back? <laughs> sorry. Uh, going to the right table, what we see is that for operating revenue, um, they've come in considerably over budget in 22 at 6%, um, which is higher than the Vermont average of 5.7%. Uh, and then 23, they came in under expectations very slightly, basically right on with budget at negative 0.1%. Um, for 24, they're projected to go slightly above budget at 1.2%, and they've attributed these changes or these overages to other operating revenue coming in 2.9 million over expectations. This is due to increased volume in the 340B contract pharmacy program, as well as unbudgeted grant revenue. And then finally, their last block in this table, the operating expenses. Uh, that show that they have historically come in over budget. So they're, it is decreasing from 7.7% in 22 to just an average of 1.1% in 24. Um, but we did also already dive into those expenses more deeply. So to tie this together at 22, it appears that the expense overage outpaced revenue overage, which is why they had a negative operating margin. 23 revenue was really close to budgeted. However, their expenses came in over budget, which created the deficit. And then in 24, both revenue and expenses, expenses are projected to have approximately a 1.1 to 1.2% overage. Thanks. Next slide, Elena. So now looking at operating margin and financial health more generally and operating margin with total margin as well as EBITDA, what we generally want to take from this is that uh, 22 kind of looks like it may have still been recovering from COVID. Many hospitals, either 22 or 23, kind of have numbers that are a little off from their 24 and 25 budgeted. We see that in FY24, their projected has both operating and total margin in the green positive. Um, and 1.6, it feels like a good stepping stone getting back to that 3.7 operating margin. And overall, we have no concerns with their total margin or EBITDA. 
So um, we're looking at days cash on hand here. I first want to address this minimum recommended level that we have cited across um, all of the pre all of the hospitals in this presentation. So generally, there's a 100 days is kind of the minimum recommended level is in the industry, but also more specifically, KFF points to 100 days as being at the bottom of the adequate level of cash days cash on hand that you want. So that's why we've kind of created this line. We're not saying it's perfect or that it's there's no changes, but that's what we've used to assess the hospitals. Uh, in this presentation. So looking at this, FCBMC looks like they would be really low. However, this is actually due to their affiliation with Dartmouth um, and keeping their day's cash on hand at the parent level. So it's actually pretty hard to tell whether or not or how healthy their day's cash on hand really is. Looking at the right in their days and patient account receivable. So this measures how long it takes for the hospital to collect payments for their services rendered. Again, this is this high performing average performance and poor performance is just one metric. We're not saying this is perfect, but these are generally where you want to be around 30 to 35 days and below is a high performing um, and about 50 to 60 and above is poor performance. Everything in between is average. And so we see that SEMC is about average. There's no concerns there, room for improvement, and we wouldn't want to see it group increase. But overall, we don't have any concerns with that. Emma, I have a Question. Yep. So in prior years, SVMC had also reported the days held at the parent organization, which is not Dartmouth, but an SVMC specific parent organization, um, which is what in prior years we had looked at. I don't know if that's available or um, yeah. worth digging out, quite frankly, but I just no, wanted yeah, to mention that point. because I think in terms of thinking historically, we've always considered that the days at the parent. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that we got that this year. Um, I could double check and Elena may know better, but as far as I know, this is what we had. And of course, this is what we pulled from adaptive. So they may be able to submit to us, you know, more specifics. And that would definitely be helpful because it's overall kind of hard to tell with SVMC what's at the parent versus what what's for them. So yeah, thank you. Yeah. I, I think in some of the prior staff presentations, there was a chart that had an asterisk for SVMC with the yeah. parent level <laughs> indicated with the asterisk. So for a uh, current ratio, we have two different formulas here. Historically and in adaptive, we've calculated current ratio by including funded depreciation. However, there's some you know debate about whether we really should be including funded depreciation in current ratio. So on the right, this graph on the right is also is another way to calculate it where we're only including assets over liabilities. Um, so generally what we want to see is that the ratio is at a one, which would indicate all their li current liabilities can be adequately covered with their existing current assets. Here we see that without that funded depreciation, SVMC is not at a current ratio of one. And even with it, they are not projected to be at one for FY24 or for budgeted for FY25. Um, so that's a bit of a concern. And then the second point that we can draw from this is just whether or not they have funded depreciation at all. That's when you have cash that covers the amount of your assets the amount that your assets have depreciated, which means that when you have to upgrade those, in theory, you have that in cash rather than having to rely on a loan. Um, so this can be really important if you have a high age of plant. So looking at SEMC, they do appear to have some, so we can now take a look at their age of plant to see how uh, useful or relevant this may be for them. So I first need to acknowledge yet another discrepancy with SEMC. Um, so we could look at these light gray and dark green lines, and we see that for our data in 23 actuals, 24 projected and 25 budget, the lines are either non-existent or very low. Um, and this is due to the fact that they're with their uh, with their uh, affiliation with Dartmouth Health, they had a one-time adjustment in 23, which has actually distorted all of the values in adaptive. So SCMC did for this one give us the values that it should actually be at, um, which are those blue outlines. And if we look at it, that makes a lot more sense. Um, it would not make really a lot of sense for them to suddenly drop to zero. And so what we do see is that they're that top yellow line indicates the 75th percentile of average age of plant. And so SCMC is above that. So it would be, uh, it would make sense for them to have some funded depreciation. And finally, for financial health, we have long-term debt to capitalization on the left, which is how much financial leveraging or the use of debt to finance growth or acquire assets the hospital has. There's really not a average or a good number for this value. The, 
general consensus is that you want it to be less than 50%. Um, so for this, we're largely looking at trends. So we see that SVMC is trending downward. Um, so that seems good. They are on the higher end of Vermont hospitals, but still overall no concerns. And then with their debt service coverage ratio on the right or the hospital's available cash flow to pay its current debt obligations, uh, we found this minimum standard minimum ratio for lenders is about 1.25. Some lenders require more, closer to 1.4 at least. And again, this is a minimum. So this is rarely where we'd want to see them be at least. So we see one, FY22 really skews this graph. And secondly, we see that in FY24, they are budgeted, or excuse me, they are projected to be over that line, which is great. So we'd like to continue to see them be at that line or above in future years. So overall, uh, FY24 is projected to produce positive margins, but again, it's really difficult to assess their financial health given that many of these metrics are affected by their relationship with and contingent on the financial health of their parent organization. So switching over now a little bit to price. So you guys have seen um, the RAND data before, but we're overall here looking at the standardized price. Um, so looking at that, we would consider SVMC to be average priced. Outpatient standardized price we can see is a bit high. Their decile is eight, but we see this across Vermont hospitals. Um, most of them are at least at the fifth or sixth decile, if not higher. So this is still average for Vermont. And we can also notice that their higher relative price uh, may indicate that they're not reimbursed as well for Medicare patient, patients, which is why their relative price skews higher than their standardized price for most of these. Um, and this is a pattern that we'll continue to see with every hospital we present. If they're a critical access hospital and they're getting reimbursed better for Medicare patients, their relative price skews lower average. And if they're not a critical access hospital, their relative price skews average or high, which is anticipated. Looking at what they assumed for public payer prices, um, so for the narrative, they said that Medicare rates will increase by 2.5% for inpatient services as of October 1st, and then 1% for outpatient services, which will begin in January of next year. And then they said that they will not, they're not anticipating Medicaid rates for increase for any services in FY25. Uh, and this matches what they we see in the workbook. We see 0% for Medicaid and 0.7% for Medicare, which seems to make sense given that that 1% for outpatient is ineffective until four months into the fiscal year. So looking at payer mix, the table on the left captures their payer mix or the revenue that the hospital makes from each type of insurance plan. We see that for SCMC, their largest group is commercial at 52.8%, followed by medic traditional Medicare as well as Medicare Advantage. Those are grouped together at 36.5% and then Medicaid at 10.6%. So for their assumptions for changes to volume um, and utilization, they're anticipating a decrease in medic traditional Medicare and Medicare Advantage, what, but anticipating an increase in Medicaid and commercial. So overall, SCMC requested an NPR increase of 3.5%, and according to their workbook, 1.7% of this will come from increased volume. Looking at uh, the projected versus actual NPR, so what we can see here is that commercial revenue projected values are overestimated compared to actual, with the exception of 21, but in 22 and 23, we can see that their commercial projected, so that's that dashed blue line, is higher than their actual values, uh, which is the solid blue line. Then for public payer revenue, their projected values are underestimating actual public dollars until 23, which again, when we see that that solid yellow line is coming below, uh, their projected public payer dollars. And this is because they began to underestimate Medicare revenue compared to actuals. Can I ask a question about that, Emma? Because I think yeah, in 23, course. we adjusted the Medicare assumptions for many of the hospitals based on the published Medicare prices. We did that yeah, in Elena, the budget you, orders. Oh, or uh, Matt, it's either Elena or Matt. I know one of you made this slide. So. <laughs> Yeah, so if we, I don't know how we would have to disaggregate that, but I think, yeah, so there could be things going on. This is just noting the difference over time. So there could be the projected amount, which is based on the point in time during the budget that they would have projected it. It's about mid-year and then the actuals as they come in. So there could be other things in there, Robin. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I What was curious to me in thinking about this is how we think about 
like the budgets are usually submitted July 1st. Medicare typically publishes their prices after that, as does Medicaid, and how that factors into yeah, like, I think projection. this is totally, and I, I think this is something we need to think about looking at over time and how these trends change. Yeah. All right, and then looking here, we're looking at their budget history. So it shows a history of requested, approved, and actuals for NPR and FPP on the left in the center operating expenses, and then on the right operating margin. So year over year, SCMC has had their NPR and FPP submitted request approved. Um, similarly, their operating expense request has been approved, approved each year. For each year, with the exception of 2020, their actuals have exceeded the approved budget submitted. And then finally, on the right, for a requested and approved margin, those have been equal, and their actually actual mar operating margin has been variable. So some years it falls short, and some years it's over. All right. Finally, looking at efficiency. So for their clinical productivity, 28.5% of their FTEs are under the 25th percentile, and 66.4% are under the 50th percentile. Uh, for costs, they are well below all their comparator groups for the average inpatient cost per Medicare discharge from 2018 to 2022. And this gap between SVMC and their comparison groups actually grew pretty significantly in 2022. For revenue, their compound annual growth rate of NPR per adjust adjusted discharge from 2018 to 2022 is 1.04%, which is below the state total of 5.26 and the national median of 6%. Finally, their admin to clinical salary ratio is higher than that of their comparator groups, but they have fallen from 49.4% to 36% between 21 and 22. So we do see that they are working to kind of reduce those administrative costs. Hi, Emma. Apologies. I'm going to interrupt one more time. Oh, sorry, Elena. Go back. Um, yes, for the top metric, uh, clinical productivity, um, we noticed recently that um, hospitals often listed a far larger number of clinical FTEs in their staffing records than they did in their clinical productivity workbook, um, sometimes five times as much. Uh, this was not just an issue with SVMC, it was an issue with pretty much all the hospitals. We still think the clinical productivity data is broadly informative, but it's not all encompassing. So for any board members or members of the public who um, want to get more specific with it, we advise you just look at the workbook and look at the departmental data. And then this is suggested motion language. I know we're not doing this today, but this is for you again to, to view and, and understand for, uh, I think, Wednesday, when we maybe start voting. So I think that's the end of the slides. And so with that, I'll stop for any board member question. Um, thank you. I think we will be making motions today and then tabling them for deliberations and votes so we can take public comment on them. Um, but I'll open up to the board for any questions or comments they have. This is have, just a comment. Oh, go ahead, Dave. Oh, just I have a quick question. Um, and uh, slide 32 would be an example slide. But, um, the orange averages line. Are those weighted averages? That, um, so that is the cumulative. So we added up all of the state of Vermont hospitals. So yeah, I guess it would be a weighted average because it's just they're totaled. Okay. So, great. And do you know if the other similar orange lines and other slides where we have uh, there was a few other examples. I think if you go back a few slides, if those are would be um, like this yeah. one here. Okay, great. Same. Yep. Thank yep. you. Thanks. Thanks, Phil. Just so I had one more comment. Just thinking, of, and this is really, I think, more for just thinking ahead, probably. Um, 20 to 22 were very off for a lot of the hospital budgets. So I wonder if in terms of assessing sort of budgets to actuals in terms of budgeting, as 
as opposed to performance. Um, I wonder if it would make sense to look and maybe next year we'll have enough with 23, 24 and 25. But uh, like to me, 20, 21 and 22 were all just really off because of COVID and post COVID stuff. So I, I tend to discount all three of those years uh, in terms of looking at budget to actual because going into the budgets, it was very clear in the in the hearings that uh, it you know nobody really knew what to anticipate for that next year. So just a thought for next year is if we if we don't think twenty three through twenty five is enough history, maybe we look back prior to twenty twenty, even though that's a ways. So just a thought. Right. And I think there's also, I think that's a great point. It's also, I don't, maybe hospitals aren't able to project the volume as well, but there were still kind of price consequences for that. So I think we have to both keep in mind, you know, some of this is not intentional, <laughs> but there, there are challenges being able to predict, but it still has consequences for what we end up approving at the end of the day. So thank you. It's a great point. Any other board member questions or comments? I have um, just, sorry, Owen. <laughs> no, you're on a roll, please go ahead. Um, so it, I'm, in terms of the second part of the motion, um, typically the change in charge has not been the same as the negotiated rating growth. So I'm assuming that for many, those will be different numbers, but I just wanted to check my assumption there. And I know that we didn't necessarily get the change in charge always so that there might be some challenges there. Yeah, and I think we did get the change in charge. We got it through the rate request through adaptive um, as we always have. I think the number that has been cited by hospitals sometimes was framed as the request, even though what we're saying is the request is this negotiated rate. Um, I think, you know, this is a board call. I think if you want to make sure prices item at the item level are capped at a rate consistent with the guidance that was set, you would want to have them be the same. If you want to allow hospitals more flexibility to pick and choose and allocate price growth across um, items, you could use uh, the charge that they submitted. Um, that would be consistent with. So I think it's it's a, a board decision what number gets put in there, but it really that number is going to be a cap on the, the growth in the list price. So I don't have the math for how hospitals anticipate allocating their price charge or their charge growth. Um, that would have to come if we wanted to tie that out and really understand that we would have to have them submit some, you know a lot more information on exactly their how their contracts all work um, and how they anticipate allocating those prices which i'm not sure we want i to guess do, i but... would want to understand the impact of because my understanding that the part of the difference was between the change in charge and the co commercial rate it relates to payer mix. So if we want to cap the charge at the same level at the rate, I would need to understand that better than I do today in terms of the impact on people other than commercial. I'm sorry, I have one more question that I should have asked earlier. Uh, I just had a different part of my notes because I, um, it, it actually goes back to slide 19, uh, Elena, that you presented. And it's just a quick question on this. This is the slide with the definitions. When we talk about the RAND price, could you define which one of these the RAND price references? Or is there? It is, it is really about the allowed amount. It is based okay. on the allowed amount. Okay. So both paid or by commercial estimate. insurer yeah. Yeah. plus the patient uh, contribution to that. Right. What Great. the hospital is collecting. Hmm. Great. Thank you so much.
Okay, can you go back to the motion language? Um, why don't we take a 10 minute break and we'll come back and take up uh, this slide. So we'll take a break, Michelle, till uh, 1026. OK, we're off the record at 1016 AM. Thank you. OK, we're back on the record at 1027 AM. Um, Ms. Barabee, could you bring up the slides again? Happy to. OK, there we go. Um, so there's a number of motions in the slide deck posted online today, and I would like to extend the public comment period so that people have more of an opportunity. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to move that we table all of the motions that are made today until September 11th or 13th to allow for additional public comment. So. I hereby move to table all future motions made today on hospital budgets or enforcement to September 11th or September 13th to allow for additional public comment on the motions. A second. second. All in favor of tabling the motions, please say aye. 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 Um, and the motion is approved. Um, I will go ahead and read the motion and we'll see if there's a second and then uh, we can open up to any board member discussion or comment and then to HCA and public comment. Uh, I move to approve uh, SVMC's budget with modifications as follows. With fiscal year 25 MPR approved at a growth rate of not more than 3.5% over its fiscal year 24 approved budget and a commensurate reduction in operating expenses. Two, with fiscal year 25 commercial change in charge and negotiated rate growth capped at 3.4% over the fiscal year 24 approved commercial rate cap, reduced from 3.5%, with no commercial rate increase for any payer exceeding that amount. And three, subject to all other standard budget conditions as approved by this board. A second. I'll ask if there's a second on the motion. A second. Is there any board discussion on the motion? Um, I have a few thoughts on the motion, but I would like to receive the public comment on the motion if there is any before. And um, thus, I will open it up to, sorry, first the HCA for any comment they may have. Nothing else from us, Chair Foster, thanks. Thank you. And public comment via raise the hand. Um, Robert, uh, I know you told me the pronunciation, but if I get it wrong, please correct me. Is it LABA? Chair Foster, that's exactly correct. Okay, great. And um, just for public comment, um, just so the record is clear, if you're associated with uh, the, a regulated entity, um, just identify that. Thank you. And, and the floor is yours, Mr. Lava. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Robert Lava, and I'm the Chief Financial Officer of SVMC. I want to first thank the board for all their time and attention to this very important work. Now, understanding that affordability is key for all Vermonters everybody needs to remember that hospitals are being asked to give high quality of care to all Vermonters. I asked the, the board to approve the SVMC budget as we submit it. In order to increase access to primary care, and to continue to invest in all the measures that we are, are, are working on to continue to reduce expenses, the budget needs to be as submitted, which is a 5.4% increase in most charges which will result in a 3.5% increase in commercial rate change growth. 
We also ask that the budget orders reflect this. Even a small decrease in our budget will have large negative impact on our operations and may prevent SVMC from moving forward with initiatives that will offer better care for Vermonters. The 1.6% operating margin that we have in our budget is dependent on all of these assumptions being approved. I strongly disagree with the staff member comment that SVMC does not need the commercial rate increase because of uh, a recent growth in Medicare. Payment is not equal, but the cost to provide services are the same, if not more. I feel it is incorrect to make this assumption. Days cash on hand were brought up today. Our investments are held by our parent organization, SVHC, not Dartmouth. All funds are controlled in Vermont by SVHC. For the record, as indicated in SVMC's budget narrative, total days cash on hand is expected to be about 175, assuming these budget assumptions are approved. Finally, capital costs continue to grow at a faster rate than they have done historically. With a high age of plant, there is a lot of deferred capital improvements that need to happen at SBMC. In order to provide a high quality of care, this work needs to be done. And to do the work, a positive operating margin is required. Any reduction in budget submission will make this difficult. As presented by Green Mountain Care Board staff, SVMC continues to decrease expenses, specifically administrative expenses. This work will continue, but will take investments to make it happen. Again, thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Laba. I appreciate those comments. Um, next, Ham Davis. Mr. Davis, maybe you're muted. Can you hear me? Okay. Come back to Mr. Davis if there's a comment. Any other public comment? And just to note again, the board will be taking written public comment um, on this motion uh, until we hold the vote. So thank you for any comments people have, and I'll turn it back to Ms. Barabee. Thank you, Chair Foster. So we'll move to the next hospital. I'm going to pass it to no Noah. Noah, take it away. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, I'll be presenting for Copley today. Um, we hope that by switching off, It'll help you all um, distinguish between each hospital. Um, this presentation is long. There are 14 hospitals, 14 unique set of problems, so we don't want them to blur together. Um, secondly, um, I'm going to repeat a lot of what Emma said um, because this is only the second presentation. I'm going to give some detail. I'm going to preface as the presentation goes on. We'll probably move a bit quicker, assume some background knowledge. Um, I know we have seven hospitals to get through today, so if I'm going too slow, too fast, Feel free to interrupt, just let me know. Um, so yes, this first slide, as a reminder, there are three core elements to a hospital budget request. That's uh, the hospital's NPR growth, commercial rate growth, and operating margin. Uh, we set benchmarks for all three of these uh, to promote both affordability and sustainability. Uh, unfortunately, if you look at the slide, uh, Copley's request surpasses two of these benchmarks, NPR and commercial rate growth, by a pretty wide margin, um, it more than triples uh, what we set in guidance for both NPR and commercial rate. Uh, so, Elena, next slide. Uh, so, to justify their request, Copley made three core arguments to the board so far. Uh, these are not comprehensive arguments. They're just the ones they highlighted uh, first in their budget narrative and then in their budget presentation to the board. Um, the first is that they have low prices. Uh, they provided a substantial amount of material to the board uh, to prove that their prices are low compared to other Vermont hospitals. Uh, this puts them at a disadvantage um, and might necessitate, necessitate a higher rate bump. Um, as their staff pointed out this year, 
um, when low priced hospitals and high priced hospitals are given the same percentage rate bump, it also expands the price gap between them. Um, their second argument is that they need to preserve their financial viability. Um, they've written in their narrative, uh, we are spending down our reserves and chipping away at our financial viability at a concerning rate. Um, and we've seen over the past few years, they've struggled with their finances. They have posted small or negative operating margins and a low day's cash on hand. We'll get into this later. Um, their third argument, uh, their financial strain this year prompted the board to give them a very rare mid-year rate bump. Uh, this bump was not intended to solve all their problems, only to get them on a more stable footing. Nevertheless, it makes the difference between FY24 budget and FY25 budget seem very high. Um, so they've specified that they're requesting an 11.8% NPR increase, but 5.9% is effectively from the mid-year rate bump. So if you take the mid-year rate bump out of the picture, it would be 5.9% from what they were granted effectively mid-year. Um, next slide. Uh, so we'll first speak to the revenue trends. Again, there's a lot of detail here, so I'll direct you all where to focus. Um, if you look on the left-hand side, um, we see a moderate rate of growth in their public payer revenue and a more significant increase in their projected and budgeted commercial revenue over the past couple of years. Uh, this is a general trend for a lot of the hospitals. Um, there's more supplemental data on the right-hand side. Um, you all can dig into that if you like. We'll post this video later. We'll probably post the slides. Um, but for now, I'm going to keep it, keep it going. Next slide. Um, this slide conveys actual to budgeted revenues per payer. Um, the red text means that actuals were lower than the budget. The black text means they're higher than the budget. Uh, there's a lot here. Copley is mostly underbudgeted, sometimes overbudgeted. Um, I'd personally like to highlight two trends. The first, uh, their budget tends to be somewhat less accurate than other hospitals. There are different reasons for that. And two, they've generally underpredicted the amount of commercial revenue that would come in, um, particularly in FY 2022. And I would expect a similar underprediction in FY 24 before they received their rate bump. Next slide. This graph is, is simpler. Uh, it shows that Copley's change in charge has increased pretty significantly over the past few years. Uh, this is the change in charge per year. It's not cumulative. So if you look at FY23, that means their charge increased by 12%, FY24 by 15%, and so on. Um, it also shows significant NPR growth. Their budgeted NPR for FY25 is nearly twice what it was six years ago in FY18. Uh, uh, this is high growth, but not uncommon for hospitals, maybe higher than, than some hospitals in Vermont. Next slide. Um, now we'll start to delve into their expense trends. Uh, so if you look at the left-hand side, we can see that their operating expense growth has grown generally at a lower rate than the Vermont average. Um, the exception would be 2024 projected this year. Um, moving to the graph on the right, um, the biggest takeaway from this graph is the distinction between labor and non-labor costs. So they provide additional information for just 2023 that gives us a bit of a window into what those uh, non-labor costs would be. Uh, most of them are pharmaceutical expenses and traveler expenses. In comparison, uh, labor-related costs include, and I'm reading from the bottom left now, salaries, fringe benefits, um, different contracts and fringes, um, mostly costs related to their um, full-time staff. Um, we see from FY 2024 to FY 25, a pretty substantial jump in labor related costs from 54% to 64%. Um, they've written in their narrative, this is mostly for staff to replace travelers and increase staff benefit, increase staff benefits. Next slide. Um, so here we'll take 
a deeper dive into expenses. Um, we're going to zoom in, just look at the difference between FY24 and FY25 and the staffing changes that they plan to make this year. Again, there's a lot of detail on this slide. Uh, big picture, they're adding 12 new full-time staff members, but eight are clinical FTEs to replace travelers in vacancies. Uh, they've written in their narrative that the overall staff vacancy rate has been high, as high as 34%, and they're um, working to fill these positions over the next few years. Next slide. This slide displays their operating margin growth over the years. As you can see, they've struggled in recent years. They posted a negative or zero margin since 2022. They've argued that they need a healthier margin this year to help rebuild some of their cash reserves. Next slide. Now we're going to start to delve into their financial health. As a reminder, this was one of the core justifications for their higher budget requests. Um, so if you look at the columns designating FY23 actuals and FY24 budget, um, you can see numbers that are very concerning, um, both a negative operating and a negative total margin. Um, this is part of the reason uh, why we gave them a mid-year rate bump in FY24 this year. And it's Part of the reason uh, Copley's asked for a little more wiggle room going forward. Next slide. Um, on the left side, you see the display of days cash on hand. On the right, days in patient account receivable, which as a reminder, estimates how long it takes the hospital to collect payments for its services. Um, so days cash on hand, um, the source we use recommends a minimum of 100 days cash on hand. This value can vary, but this is what we've used for this presentation. Um, you can see Copley has been consistently below this minimum level. It's days cash on hand is hovering around 60 days. And um, we'd like to see that can, uh, increase over the next few years. On the right hand side um, in PAR, uh, you see in 2022, 2023, they posted a relatively poor performance, but it's been improving uh, pretty quickly over time. Next slide. This is a graph of their current ratio. Um, a ratio of one or higher indicates that all current liabilities could be adequately covered by the hospital's existing assets, their current assets. Um, the average current ratio for U.S. hospitals is 2.79. That's a U.S. median. Um, that's not a, oh, that average is 2.79. The U.S. median is hovering above 1.5 um, at 1.7, I believe. Um, it seems like Copley's in a healthier range, well above the U.S. median, a little below what would be the U.S. average. Next slide. This displays their age of plant, which is generally the age of their infrastructure. It conveys if they're going to need money to reinvest in their facilities anytime soon. Um, you see two yellow lines here designating the 25th percentile for US hospitals and the 75th for US hospitals. Um, and you can see Copley is about smack in the middle. So um, something we want to keep track of in the future, but nothing for immediate concern. Next slide. Um, two final financial metrics here, uh, long-term debt to capitalization, which shows how much financial leveraging a firm has. Uh, that's the use of debt to finance growth, acquire other assets. Uh, a lower LTDC is better. Generally, hospitals want to stay somewhere around under 50% at the most. You know, Again, those numbers vary. Um, we see that Copley's budgeted to be around 30%, um, which is, again, nothing for immediate concern. Uh, the graph on the right, Sort of flip your mind if the graph on the left down is good, graph on the right up is good. Uh, the debt service coverage ratio measures a firm's available cash flow to pay its debt obligations. Um, most lenders require at least 1.25, some closer to 1.4. Again, we see that um, Copley posts a coverage ratio that's not, not too concerning here. Next slide. 
So summary of their financial health indicators, um, a lot to be worried about, but generally improving. I think that's the main theme. Um, there's concerning data in the recent past, but they're projecting positive margins for FY24, barely, and FY25 budgeted a little more significantly. Uh, their day's cash on hand is low, which is something we want to consider and continue to monitor. Uh, their PAR has improved uh, pretty quickly over the last few years. Current ratio is strong. Uh, age of plant smack in the middle of the national range and no real concerns with long-term debt capitalization or debt service coverage. Next slide. Here we have a display of the RAND prices. Again, should be familiar to the board and any uh, members of the public who've attended our meetings. Um, first, want to look at the standardized prices on the right. We see that Copley's prices are generally low within exception of outpatient prices, which are around the national median, probably a little below average for Vermont. Um, if you go to relative price on the left, uh, we see that their relative prices are much lower. Um, and this suggests that they're reimbursed well for Medicare. Uh, this makes sense, uh, given their status as a critical access hospital, that they um, would have more favorable Medicare reimbursements than, than other hospitals. Next slide. And as a reminder, those low prices, again, a core justification for their, their budget request. Uh, now we'll delve into their budget assumptions. Um, it's part of our role here at the board to probe um, these hospital assumptions a little bit, make sure that they're reasonable. Um, they did not specify uh, an assumption for Medicare in their narrative. Um, they specified, like most hospitals, that they expect Medicaid to keep rates constant this year. From their workbook, however, we lifted that they're expecting a 9% uh, reimbursement increase from Medicare and 0% from Medicaid. Next slide. Now to delve into their volume assumptions, on the left we have the pair mix. Again, the money that the hospital makes from respective insurance plans. Uh, Copley is majority commercial revenue, about 61%, a smaller amount Medicare revenue, about 26%, and a smaller amount Medicaid, about 13%. On the right, we have changes to volume or utilization. This is not pair mix. It doesn't concern payments. It just concerns um, uh, services utilized by beneficiaries of each plan. Um, as you can see, they're not projecting really any change in volume. Um, their volumes are projected to remain pretty much stagnant this year, tiny, tiny increases in Medicare and commercial, um, but they attribute only a 0.2% NPR increase to any volume changes. Um, so to read from the bottom of the slide, as Copley, Copley requested an NPR increase of 11.8%, 5.9, from the mid-year rate bump, 5.9 from now. According to their workbook, 0 0.2 will come from increased volume. Next slide. Again, this is the slide that um, we prepared um, that Robin expressed some reservations about. Um, nothing too concerning here. Again, there were some adjustments made in 2023, um, but generally looks like um, projected values were um, somewhat lower than actual for public payers, somewhat higher for private payers, but no, no real pattern, nothing of significance. Next slide. So this delves into their budget history. There are three graphs here, so I apologize if they're difficult to read, but I'll summarize them very quickly. Um, so Copley's had some adjustments over the past few years. Um, they had their NPR FPP request reduced in 2021, 2022, in 2024. It was approved in 2020 and 2023. Um, they had their operating expense request reduced um, every year, 2020 through 2024, although 2021, the reduction was quite small. And last, um, the requested and approved margin have been equal. Um, in 2022 and 2024, the approved margin was less than requested. Um, Actual margins have typically been less than projected with the exception of 2021. Next slide. This is a summary of their efficiency data. There's a lot of efficiency data. When we initially drafted this presentation, we had 
10, 15 slides just discussing efficiency. We really try to condense it down. Um, one metric here is from the hospitals themselves. That's clinical productivity. Um, according to Copley's own records, 30.6% of their clinical FDEs are under the 25th percentile. Over 90% are under the 50th percentile. So that's confusing. Um, again, take this with a grain of salt. It measures 20.9 clinical FTEs. Um, it's not all of them on the staff. This is something we're going to consider for next year and try to delve into a bit more. Um, all the other efficiency metrics we listed from NASHP. Um, it suggests they're first on cost, relatively cheap for Medicare. Their cost per Medicare discharge is uh, pretty low compared to peer groups. Um, next on revenue, their compounded annual growth rate is outpacing state and national cause critical access hospitals, especially over the past couple of years. We've seen much larger increases. And they post a relatively low admin to clinical salary ratio. And finally, on the right, just as a final reminder, we've posted the three core justifications for this budget request, low prices, financial viability, and their mid-year rate increase. Next slide. And I believe that will be it for me. I'll pass it to you, Owen, or to you, Elena, wh whoever wants to take over. Um, I can take it. I had one question just to make sure I understood it. I think you said it for SVMC too. The mm -hmm. staffing records versus FTE workbook. Yeah. So the FTE workbook is what's being used to calculate the productivity data. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. And then there's a, a staffing record that has a higher mm -hmm. number of clinicians. That's correct. Okay. Um, any other, uh, you know, I'll actually make the motion and then we can take board member questions and comments. Um, thank you for that presentation. Um, I move to approve Copley's budget with modifications as follows. With fiscal year 25, NPR approved at a growth rate of not more than 6% over its fiscal year 24 approved budget, reduced from 11.8%, and a commensurate reduction in operating expenses. Two, with a fiscal year 25 commercial change in charge and negotiated rate growth capped at 6.4% over the fiscal year 24 approved commercial rate cap reduced from 10.5% with no commercial rate increase for any payer exceeding that amount and three subject to all other standard budget conditions as approved by this board. Second. And I have no other questions or comments, but I'll open it up to the other board members. I have a question on the NPR component of Copley. When I looked at their 24 projected, which I don't think you, maybe that is on that slide, I'm not sure. Um, and then I looked at what the um, value of the recommended price increases, it looks like they would actually be a million over the approved NPR just on price alone. So I think, I, so I just have a question about whether or not, um, if we think this is the right price increase, whether the NPR then flows logically from the mid-year plus this price increase. Uh, I'm not expecting you to answer that today, but I, that gives me a reservation about the staff recommendation because I, I could be totally wrong, but I think I'm concerned that we're setting them up to basically be over by not considering the price impact on the MPR based on where they are to coming in today, which it sounds like is largely due to the mid-year price increase. Elena, do you want to answer that question? Yeah, I think we have to look at it. I don't okay. <laughs> thank you, Robin, for raising that. We can take that back and look at it. Um, yes, thank you. Yeah, and again, wasn't expecting anybody to comment today. Just wanted to raise okay. it so people could think about it and um, double check the math.
Could I ask a question on uh, this, the second part of this motion, actually, and it relates back to, so because of the mid-year rate increase, when we say the FY24 approved commercial rate cap, is that specific to their, to, to which the mid-year cap or the uh, earlier uh, original cap? This, Mark, I think this is, so sorry, can you ask your question again? The rate cap is compared to their mid-year, right? Because we kind of take mid-year as their new revised. Is that what you're asking? Yes. Yeah, so we grow from the latest approved budget. So approved budget could be at the beginning in our normal cycle, or it could happen. It could be updated throughout the year. So you okay, could so rebase. You could, if you think the price is right for Copley, for example, or any other hospital, you could rebase their NPR to adjust to that, or you could, you know, there's a lot of ways to deal with it. But. Okay. So I thought what Noah had presented here was that a 5.9% commercial rate increase um, over the mid-year would net their requested 10.5% from budget to budget. Did I misunderstand that? So I think what they specified in their narrative, and this is their claim, not our claim, is that of their NPR requests, 5.9 is coming just from their mid-year rate, if you were to keep that constant. Because there's gonna be a difference from FY24 budget to FY25 budget. Let's take this back. Cool. I don't want to do math yep. Yep. <laughs> on the fly, okay. especially with yep. all the different definitions of rate, but we can hammer this out and we can, I'll summarize everything that. versus projected. I think I have that and apologies for not putting it up front, um, but we'll do that first thing Monday morning. Okay. So thank Thanks. you for the comment. Yeah. The other question I have uh, is, is for the team on slide 51. And it basically shows, or the way you describe this, Noah, and it's broken mm -hmm. out in 23, was that other purchased services, which includes travelers, are counted as non-labor. Is that a common reporting mechanism for all hospitals that purchased services? I guess that would include consulting uh, when you hire people to come do an analysis or help you solve a problem, but also traveling nurses, techs, locums, docs, that would come out of it, that, that would be reported as non-labor in this. Is that accurate for, for, is that, can I generalize that across all hospitals? Uh, it's, this is Matt Sutter here. I just wanted to jump in real quick. Um, in general, the reporting on um, contract labor has been inconsistent and it would I don't believe it'll roll into labor on these charts here. Um, it typically falls under like a different account under other operating revenue for most hospitals, but not always consistently between them. Um, so uh, to answer your question, it, I don't believe it. No, not on this chart. It does not. Okay, other operating expenses. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks. Thanks. That's it for me. Other board member questions or comments? Uh, anything from the healthcare advocate? No, nothing from us. Thanks. Can, can I ask yeah. one more question of you? Uh, anyone on the team? Do, do you know um, what a day of cash on hand is worth at Copley? How much? How much cash is one day of cash on hand? We can would, get that. Would you to get that you? for me? Great. Thanks. I think we. I think we have it somewhere, Matt, if you could, oh, we'll get that to you. Great, we'll Thanks. provide it, yeah. And public comment via the raise the hand function. Um, Mr. Davis, your hand's kind of been up and down and up, so I'm not sure if you're there, but if you are, please go ahead.
Okay, I'll take that as a no. Any other public comment on the motion? I right, thank you, and I'll turn it back to you, Ms. Barabee. Great. All righty. Uh, we're going to move now to Rutland. So Emma's back up. Great. Thank you, Emma. Yeah. All right. Um, so just going into Rutland now. Looking at their benchmarks, we can see that their commercial rate is below benchmark at 2.8%. Their NPR is above the, ben the benchmark of 3.5 at 6.1%. And overall, that 6.1% constitutes about 5% of the system over guidance. Uh, whereas for their commercial rate request, the percentage of the system since it's below the guidance is actually negative 2%. And then their operating margins at 2.5%, which is 9% of the total system. So uh, for justification for their higher NPR, they cite a need to increase utilization to outpatient service lines. Uh, in their narrative, they wrote that they requested a high NPR to expand access and reduce wait times for outpatient services, which includes outpatient surgical services, laboratory volume, diagnostic imaging, MRI, infusion center services, CT scan, pharmacy, and endoscopy. Looking at, again, their NPR growth by payer. So once again, we see that commercial is their highest. Um, it's grown quite a substantial bit from 124.1 million in 2018 up to 221.2 million in, uh, or for the budgeted for FY25. Next is Medicare's at Green Line. We see, and this may be what Member Lund was discussing earlier, that there's a, quite a drop in Medicare from 23 to 24 projected. Um, so actually overall from 2018 to 2025, it's decreased. Uh, so that may be, we may be seeing some of what Member Lund was saying there. And then for Medicaid, we see uh, an increase very slight again from 21.2 million to 35.2 million. Next slide, Lena. So once again, here we want to look at overall trends with uh, commercial Medicaid and Medicare specifically. So what we see is that for commercial, it kind of ebbs and flows back and forth, which is more of what we'd expect to see some years that it's over, some years it's under, and, and that's pretty much expected. Um, for Medicaid overall, with all years with the exception of two, they have been over budgeting for Medicaid. However, it's the opposite for Medicare. Again, kind of ignoring FY20, um, for Medicare, they have over budget or excuse me they've under budgeted every year for medicaid or for medicare excuse me except for 2020 and so what we see from this is that um they're getting more money from medicare than that they're budgeting for each year um and so that again could be taken out from the commercial rate next slide Looking at their change in charge, and this is particularly important for Rutland, uh, noting that they are one of the hospitals that is up for potential enforcement. Um, we see that prior to 2021, it's pretty low, but we see the huge increase from 2022 at 3.64% change in charge to a 17.4% change in charge in 2023. Um, and this is the year that we are you know, looking at for enforcement. And so we see that they got a huge rate increase and that may be why you know, they've led to this overage in NPR is they likely did not need that full rate increase. Looking at their expenses, um, so we can see that Rutland has kept expense growth below the total Vermont expense growth year over year on the left hand side. And then looking at the right hand side, again, looking at we're trying to see the bulk of expenses. So we see that bottom bar is the labor um, and then looking specifically at 25 just for ease. 3% uh, is medical and surgical supplies, 21% other non salary expenses. 4% for other purchase services or travelers and then 9% pharmaceuticals. From the table below that, where we're looking at labor specifically, we see that over the past three years, Rutland has underestimated their labor expense. Um, in the narrative, they call out filling vacancies in general surgery and women's health, um, an increased reliance on per diem staff, which is still more affordable than travelers, as well as locum expenses reducing. After labor, uh, we see the second largest bucket, bucket is that other non-salary expense. 
for 24. These are projected to come in under budget with negative year over year growth. We can see it's negative 5.5%. Uh, and there's only 2.8% budgeted growth for FY25. Next slide, Elena. Looking at their labor, first we can start with their clinical and non-clinical budgeted split. So they're 61% clinical FTEs versus 39% non-clinical. However, for their distribution of their additional FTEs that they're adding in FY25, that's a 77% clinical versus 23% non-clinical split. Overall, in their labor expenses in the narrative, again, they talk about reduction of locum expense, which is expected as provider vacancies are filled, as well as contracted labor expenses um, anticipated to decrease with the onboarding of new nursing graduates to fill vacant positions. One thing I do want to note on the right-hand side, so we see that the largest change is just clinics, uh, clinical FTEs with 15. But the underneath that, the OBGYN clinical FTEs looks like it's decreasing by 7. Yet in the prior side, there's that call out to vacancies being filled in general surgery and women's health. Um, these exhibits are projected to budget instead of budget to budget. So that may be the reason that there's this drop in OBGYN versus what the narrative speaks to. It could also just be a reporting difference. So we did want to kind of call that out there. Looking at their operating margin growth overall, and what we see is that in 2022, Rutland fell short of their operating margin budget. Again, this was a very common occurrence in Vermont, um, but they did fall worse than the average uh, Vermont total operating margin at negative 3.8% compared to the Vermont average of negative 1.8%. In 23, we can see that they were able to recover back to a positive operating margin of about 2%, and that's carried into 24. Um, and in the narrative, they speak to this operating margin being sufficient to support investments in FY25 at 2.5%, as well as um, investments in the workforce, benefit programs, enhanced services, capital equipment, uh, investments, principal payments, and necessary facility infrastructure improvements. So that's a reasoning for that 2.5% operating uh, margin. And then overall, historically, Rutland has underestimated operating revenue in the budget. We can see on that right-hand side under operating revenue, it's been it's gone from 14.1% in 2022. It is down to 1.7% in 2024. So that overage is decreasing that difference between the budget and the actual. And then in the third block, we see the, actually the exact same uh, pattern of a higher difference in actual versus budget in 22, and that's come down from 15.6% in 22 down to 1.9% in 24. So overall, 22 uh, in 2022, it, exp it appears expense overages outpaced revenue, and that contributed to the deficit. In 23, the revenue and expense overages grew at a similar rate, um, and that actually created an operating margin that was only about 200,000 over budget. And then in 24, operating expense overages are coming in slightly higher than expected, and that's outpacing overages in revenue, which is creating an operating margin that's slightly less than their budgeted amount. Um, and they noted that this year's overages are attributed to variances in the pharmacy and drugs related to 340B, as well as additional expenses from physician salaries. So now looking at financial health overall, so we can again see that their actuals for FY22 are their lowest, which again could be effects still remaining from COVID. Um, another important point just overall in this chart is what we'll see is typically the budgeted and actual values are quite close for Rutland, which is a pretty common theme overall, uh, which gives us more confidence that their budgeted values are reasonable and will likely be close to their actual values. Uh, for FY25, again, they have that 2.5% operating margin which is continuing to climb closer to that pre-COVID standard of about 3% uh, and no concerns overall for total margin or EBITDA. Looking at their day's cash on hand, well over the recommended level. Looks like they're climbing towards closer and closer to 200, but well over 150 since 2022. Uh, so no concerns there. As well as in their days in patient account receivable, this is on the low end of the average, getting close to that high performance area some estimates say that 35 days and below is high performing, um, so we could consider Rutland to be average to high performing, and there's no concerns here either. And looking at their current ratio, we can see that on the right, when we're not including funded depreciation, uh, Rutland is 
at or above that one, and it's actually close to the getting closer each year to that U.S. median with the funded depreciation. On the left, we can see that their levels are much higher than the U.S. median and steadily increasing. Uh, so, considering this difference between these two graphs, we would it would appear that Rutland has a good amount of unrestricted funded depreciation. So, we can then look at their age of plant to get a sense of uh, why this may be. And we do see that that supports this, which is that Rutland is above the 75th percentile for age of plant. Um, so having a lot of funded depreciation makes sense, seems uh, fiscally responsible. They have a number of capital expenditures dedicated to aging infrastructure and equipment needs in FY25, which is likely why we see that that uh, age of plant in FY25 budgeted is not increasing. Looking at long-term debt to capitalization, Overall, we see it's low. We see it's in the teens, which is on the low end for Vermont, and it's been declining pretty steadily, so no issues there. Looking at their debt service coverage ratio on the right, um, it's above the standard minimum ratio, again, with the exception of 22, uh, but it's pretty solidly above that line, and so we expect that to continue, and we don't have any concerns with this graph either. So overall, we would say Rutland is pretty financially stable. Their margins are solid. Days cash on hand is well above the minimum recommended amount. Their days in patient account receivable has good performance. Their current ratio is good, even without unrestricted funded depreciation, or they do also have a good amount of that. Um, and overall, there's no concerns with their long-term debt to capitalization or debt service coverage ratio. Switching to price, uh, generally Rutland appears to be average priced. Um, we see on their standardized price decibels, they're about six, and they actually have one that's lower. Uh, the higher relative price we see, it's all eights or nines with the exception of inpatient, may indicate that they are not reimbursed as well for Medicare patients, which again is why their relative price skews higher than standardized, which is anticipated given that they're not a critical access hospital and likely aren't reimbursed as well for Medicare patients. For assumptions for Medicare and Medicaid price reimbursement, for Medicare, they applied the anticipated inflationary market basket of 2.6%. This is for both inpatient and outpatient services, which resulted in an aggregated improvement of 0.97% in the Medicare rate budget to budget. And then they also uh, did not include any changes in the budget for in-state or out-of-state Medicaid reimbursement. And this is reflected the exact same in their workbook, 0% for Medicaid and 1% rounded for Medicare. Looking at their volume and then firstly their payer mix, we see that they are majority commercial or their highest one is commercial. There's 62.9% there. For med traditional Medicare and Medicare Advantage, it's at 26.2% and then almost 11% for Medicaid. Looking at the changes to volume or utilization, it looks like they are anticipating a decrease in Medicaid volume, but an increase in traditional Medicare, especially in Medicare Advantage at 21.3%, and an increase in commercial as well at 2.9%. Overall, Rutland requested an NPR of 6.1%, so according to their workbook, 4.6% of this will come from increased volume. Looking at their projected versus actual NPR, we see that commercial revenue projected in 2021 was underestimated. However, this difference is much less in 22 and 23. Um, we see it's pretty close to that solid line. And then similarly for public payers, only in 22 did it seem like they really underestimated their public payer revenue. 21 and 23 seem about on par. Looking at their budget history, year over year, Rutland has had NPR and FPP submitted request approved. So that's that graph on the left. In the center, they've also had their operating expense request approved year over year. And finally, on the right, their requested and approved margin have been equal, but their actual margin has been lower than the approved margin with the exception of 2021. Finally, for efficiency overall, um, for, they don't have clinical productivity, or we don't have that data from them, and that's because it was not required. We said in guidance that if they complied with the operating margin and the commercial rate request, as long as those were both within benchmarks, that they didn't have to submit clinical productivity. So that's why we don't have that information for Rutland. Uh, for cost, all comparator groups for the average inpatient costs per Medicare discharge from 2018 to 2022, they were above those. Um, and that gap is increasing, so they seem to be becoming more expensive. 
For revenue, their NPR per discharge is higher than the Vermont median, but their compound annual growth rate is negative 0.14% from 2018 to 2022. Looking at their admin to clinical salary ratio, this varied a lot year to year. Sometimes they were notably higher and sometimes notably lower than the ratios in their comparison groups. But in 2022, which is the most recent year of data we have, they were at 20.2%, which was lower than their comparators. And then in direct patient care FTEs, they were higher than all other uh, than all of their comparator groups. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Chair Foster. Um, thank you. I'll go ahead and make this motion recommended by the staff and then see if there's a second and then we can have board discussion. Um, so I move to approve RRMC's budget with modifications as follows. With fiscal year 25 MPR approved at a growth rate of not more than 5% over its fiscal year 24 approved budget reduced from 6.1% and a commensurate reduction in operating expenses. With fiscal year 25 commercial change in charge and negotiated rate growth capped at 2.8% over the fiscal year 24 approved commercial rate cap with no commercial rate increase for any payer exceeding that amount. And three, subject to all their standard budget conditions as approved by this board. Second. Um, I have two comments slash questions, I guess. Um, on slide 81, the RAND data. These are, I'm just clarifying it, but these are national deciles, not Vermont. So these are versus national, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Right. And then these RAND 5.0 runs through fiscal year 22 data and does not include fiscal year 23? Yep, that's correct as well. So that fiscal year 23 17.4 increase that was approved by the board is not represented in this data, correct? Exactly, yeah. Um, I'm going to ask that we send a follow-up to Rutland for the clinical productivity versus benchmark. I know that they weren't required to do so as part of the fiscal year 25 budget process, but um, considering the potential enforcement and the increase in uh, clinical uh, expenses and staffing expenses, I think it would be helpful to have that information in evaluating the necessity of that. Um, so I'll just flag it for the record that we're going to follow up with Rutland for the clinical productivity versus benchmarks so that we can consider it in light of the staffing expense for the um, fiscal year 23 enforcement issue. And I have nothing else but a lot of gratitude for all this really immense work um, that you guys have done and I'll turn it to the other board members. I guess my question is, um, so is the suggested motion language inclusive of enforcement or what's, did I miss that? Uh, no. So these are two separate matters that will necessitate, if if enforcement action is taken for any hospital, will it will necessitate a separate enforcement order. So these are these are separate actions. The motion language here is specific to the board's determination for FY25 budget. Um, the enforcement motions for any hospitals um, will further modify the reduction of commercial rate um, what the board determines for FY25, but those are those are going to be taken up separately and next. Thanks for the clarification. Any other board member comments or questions? I'll turn to the HCA for any comments or questions they may have. Uh, nothing from us. Uh, Robin asked my, or Member Lunch asked our question. Thank you. And uh, I'll open it up to public comment. Uh, 
Um, I hope I pronounced the name correctly, but I believe it's Mitchell uh, Baruti. Yes, Chair Foster, Doctor, that is correct. Dr. Baruti, do I have that right? Uh, no, Mitch Baruti. I'm the Vice President and Chief Legal Officer at Rutland mm -hmm. Regional Medical Center. Right, great. Okay. Uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Foster, members of the Green Mountain Care Board, and staff. I appreciate the opportunity to issue public comment today regarding the continued health and well being of the communities we serve. We all understand that operating a hospital and ensuring the financial sustainability of health care is no easy task. And I recognize that you, as members of the Green Mountain Care Board, face the difficult responsibility of a balancing affordability with access to quality health care. And these are not easy decisions, but they're necessary. They also have wide ranging consequences. When our hospitals succeed, it's not just about the financials, it's about the people, the patients, and the communities we serve. It's about our neighbors, our families, the folks we see at the grocery store or at school pickup. It's about making sure that when individuals need care, they can get it. Whether it's a cancer screening, a life saving surgery, or a bed in a time of crisis, these are the moments that define not just our hospitals, but our communities itself. We know that when hospitals struggle, communities and the people living and working within these communities end up feeling it most. When services are reduced or access becomes limited, it's the local farmer, the small business owner, the teacher who may have to go without the care they need. And let's be clear, when that happens, it's not just a hospital issue, it's a community issue. I understand your role in ensuring that healthcare is affordable for all Vermonters, and that's something we respect at Rutland Regional Medical Center. But in the process of making these decisions, we must also ensure that we're not compromising the care our communities depend on. And when funding is reduced to a point where services are cut, the price we pay isn't just financial, it's personal. It's the residents who live and work in our region who suffer and bear the burden of limited access to care when expenses, when expenses are cut. We don't wanna be adversaries in this process. In fact, we share a common goal. We wanna work with you to find a solution that ensures both fiscal responsibility and access to the high quality care Vermonters deserve. And Rutland Regional Medical Center, like so many other hospitals across the state, is here to serve the people, to keep them healthy and whole, and to be a pillar of strength in times of need. But to do that, we need the resources to provide that care, strengthen our workforce, and invest in important capital improvements to our buildings, equipment, and technology. The staff recommendations presented on September 4th do raise some concerns that will have unfortunate impacts to these initiatives. The recommendations did not fully account, in our opinion, for the evidence we provided or the reality we are facing on the ground. And while we're ready to work with you to find common ground, we believe the recommendations, if adopted, could lead to outcomes that would be detrimental to the communities we serve, namely reduced services, fewer available vet beds, reduced capital investment to expand access, and longer wait times for critical care. So in closing, I wanna reiterate why we're here. We're here to make sure that Vermonters and those in our community have access to the care they need when they need it. We need to do that in a way that's sustainable for the long term, and I believe we can achieve that balance together. I ask that you consider the needs of communities served by Rutland Regional Medical Center and not only approve our budget as requested, but to use your discretion to forego reducing the FY25 rates to compensate for the FY23 variants. Enforcing the FY23 budget in this FY25 cycle will negatively impact the communities we serve. We respectfully request that you use your discretion so that you can continue to provide, so that we can continue to provide access to the essential healthcare services in which people rely every single day in our region. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate that. The very thoughtful comments, and um, we appreciate you speaking up and sharing those with us. Any other public comment? Okay. Um, thank you. And we'll turn it back to um, Ms. Barabee. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so I'm just gonna summarize. You've seen these, um, I think, way back in March, I believe, um, or just after. These are the uh, Rutland's financials. Um, 
and summarizing their FY23 performance. Um, and so what you can see is that they came in um, at 4% over on revenue and 4% over on operating expense budget to actual. Um, and so this means that for every dollar of revenue that they earned, they also spent overspent the budget um, at the same rate. Um, you can see a summary of their operating margin over time through FY23. So this resulted in almost $8 million um, uh, surplus. 7.4 million to be precise, um, though the net patient revenue was over by the 11 million that I showed you earlier. Um, so again, the recommendation that we presented earlier this week was for partial enforcement. So 50% of the NPR over budget. I understand there's some confusion about how I presented this earlier. I wanna be clear, there's no hold harmless on the first 1%, it's 50% of the NPR overage. Um, implemented through a downward adjustment to commercial rate. This is, again, not intended to be a penalty, but is to be kind of a true up to the unanticipated volume um, that Rutland saw relative to what they expected in FY23. Um, again, so the rationale is here. The overage was primarily due to the unanticipated volume of patients coming in from out of um, the HSA. Um, I just wanted to, to kind of suggest that the 50% is really based on um, what we understand to be uh, possibly, you know, the marginal cost of delivering care. So there probably are some expenses incurred um, as you are expanding access to care for additional patients, but we wouldn't expect it to be a dollar for dollar growth. Um, according to MedPAC, um, hospitals, efficient hospitals often have a cost structure where 70% of the costs are considered fixed, with 30% being variable. Um, we propose 50%, which is conservative relative to this 70%, which would be if we were calling back the um, based on the MedPAC's recommendation. So I will pause there and turn it back to Chair Foster. Thank you, um, and I'll just note that I believe there's some additional information that came in when I saw it yesterday, maybe it was the day before, um, that's up on the website relating to some of the follow-up that the board had asked, and I'll just refer the public to that information that's relevant to this issue and motion. Um, I will make the motion and see if there's a second, and then we can proceed. I move that we find that RRMC's performance differed substantially from its fiscal year 23 budget. And I'm sorry, I move that we find that RRMC's performance differed substantially from its fiscal year 23 budget. I move to deny Rutland Regional Medical Center's application for retroactive adjustment of its fiscal year 23 budget and move to enforce this violation by reducing the fiscal year 25 commercial change in charge and negotiated rate growth cap from 2.8% over the fiscal year 24 approved commercial rate cap to 0.8% under the fiscal year 24 approved commercial rate cap with no commercial in rate increase for any payer exceeding that amount. I will second. Now we'll open it up to the board for comment. And I will turn to the HCA for any comment they have. Nothing from us, thank you. And I'll open it up to the public for public comment. Um, Dr. Boynton. Hi, thank you, Chair Foster. Um, I uh, practice at Rutland Regional Medical Center. Um, we don't really have an ability to restrict volume. So patients that seek care at our medical center, um, I believe deserve to receive that care. Um, it, I was just told that um, the overage um, in terms of revenue was uh, essentially equal to the overage in terms of expense. Um, when the need for care outstrips the supply, you know, patients in the mid Vermont region can seek care in New York. They can go uh, across the border to Dartmouth. Um, waiting for care doesn't help them. Changes in care supply at other 
HSAs um, can result in patients uh, making a drive to receive care other places. So I would hope that that would all be reflected um, in your uh, decision making. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Boynton, um, and thanks for serving the Rutland community. Um, I'm sure we'll discuss this probably more deeply next week, but the board's rule does contemplate those issues that you raised and, and will be necessarily part of our consideration of this issue. So thank you for raising them as they are relevant. Any other public comment? Okay. Um, why don't we take just a quick three minute break um, and we'll come back at 11.35. So um, Michelle, we'll go off the record for three minutes. Thank you. Okay, we're off the record at 11.32 a.m. Okay, we're back on the record at 11.36 a.m. Thank you. Um, I believe we have Grace Cottage Hospital, the staff presentation next. Um, Ms. Barbie? Yes. Okay, and so next up, we have Grace Cottage and Janelle um, will be leading us through those slides. Thanks, Janelle. Okay. Um, so I'll go ahead and dive right in. They have requested a 12% NPR increase, which equates to about 31 million. And this contributes to 1% of the system overage above guidance of 3.5%. Uh, they came in under benchmark on their commercial rate request at only two and a half percent. This equates to about a 317,000 increase and it contributes to zero percent of the system guidance of 3.4. And their budget has a negative operating margin of 2.3 percent. Uh, this decreases the system operating margin by approximately one percent. Uh, next slide. So they have two core reasons as to why their NPR is justified coming in over benchmark. Um, so they need to make process improvements with their rural health clinic. Grace Cottage has requested a higher NPR in part to account for the goal of increased productivity and process improvements within their rural health clinic. They argue that the NPR jump would not incur additional expenses. And they need to add one FCE physical therapist. They have hired an additional provider to increase access to outpatient physical therapy. Um, and they justify a negative operating margin because they can rely on donations. While a positive operating margin would be ideal, the submitted budget reflects a minimum, minimal operating loss slightly better than the loss submitted for fiscal year 24. The overall positive total margin is attributed to contributions by our generous supporters with larger amounts in fiscal year 25 at the beginning phase of the new clinical building project. And next slide. So um, similar to other presenters, I'm gonna focus on the left side here. So you can see the history of NPR growth by payer. Medicare is the top line. Um, it has always had the greatest NPR, but commercial is approaching Medicare levels in years 23 to 25. Um, and then Medicaid has slowly increased, um, but at a much lower rate. And we can go to the next slide. Um, so looking at this, commercial, commercial has consistently been under budgeted with the exception of 2019. Medicaid has been over budgeted up until fiscal year 20 and under budget for 21 and beyond. And then Medicare has consistently been over budgeted. The total NPR has been over budgeted with the exception of 2022. Um, but for the most part, it hovers around a little under 3% with the exception of 22 again. <laughs> um, next slide. Okay, so 
also um, just observing here, um, it looks like the change in charge changing charge was uh, 5% for 2018. It dropped to around 3.2% for three years, and then it, it um, jumped to about 5% for 22, 23, and a little dip in 24, and it projected to once again jump in 2025. My apologies for interrupting, Mr. Chair. I am having a little bit of um, a problem uh, with um, Miss Janelle coming across clearly for me. I don't know if anybody else is. Oh, sorry, I'll speak up a little bit. Um, yeah, I, sorry. Um, so then if we look at the budgeted versus actual, um, it appears that budgeted has typically come in under or sorry, budgeted has um, or actuals have exceeded budgeted for the most part, with the exception of year 20, uh, 2019. And then we can move to the next slide. So here we we look at the expenses, um, just like the other hospital. So. Um, if we we can look, um, typically expense year over year increase has been a little bit over the Vermont average, uh, with the exception of 2025. Um, and then if we shift to the rate table, we can see that um, you know they split out their the, the bulk of their expenses are split between labor and other non salary expense. Um, in their narrative, they call out the use. The continued use of contracted labor in nursing, diagnostic imaging, and physical therapy. However, at a lower number in nursing, the area with the highest number of contracted labor. In the table below, you can see typically labor expense has been over budgeted, excluding 2022, while other non salary expense has been under budgeted. And then for 2025, Grace College is expecting a 9.5% growth in their labor expense as well as the 16.4 decrease in their other non-salary expense. And next slide. Okay. So here I'll just um, read some of the call outs from the narrative. The goal is to return to employed staff instead of contracted labor. The 25 budget includes continued use of contracted labor in nursing, well, similar to what I read earlier, uh, diagnostic imaging and physical therapy, however, at a lower number. Um, and then one additional FTE is needed in physical therapy department due to increased demand and improved efficiencies in the rural health clinic and will allow additional patient encounters with no additional staff. Um, next slide. So well, historically, Grace Cottage has had negative operating margins. However, they have noted that they are able to make up the difference through charitable donations. On average, Grace Cottage underestimates revenues with the exception of 2023. Also, Grace Cottage underestimates expenses, typically at a rate greater than their underestimate of re uh, revenues, which creates a larger deficit than budgeted. Um, in 2024, both revenues and expenses are coming in over budget. The narrative um, Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, the narrative speaks to continued increased demand for services, including outpatient physical therapy and primary care. And they're budgeting an increase in utilization in both areas for fiscal year 25. And we can move to the next slide. So operating margins for grace are typically negative. Total margins have been negative for 2022, 2023, um, but it's projected positive for 2024. Um, it also does appear that actuals have typically come in a bit lower than budgeted consistently. And we can move to the next slide. 
So for days cash on hand, grades was right at the minimum recommended level in 2022, but they haven't quite met Fed's budget and have dropped below the minimum recommended level over the past three years. Uh, and for days in patient account receivable, it looks to be about average, so there are no concerns. Uh, year over year, it's been slightly increasing, but in 2024, it was pretty close to flat, the, the increase that is, and they are budgeting it for, for it to remain pretty much flat for 2025. And then we can move to the next slide. Um, so, Grace, doesn't, Grace Cottage does not have unrestricted funded depreciation on the balance sheet. So there's only one graph here. Again, we wanna see a ratio of at least one, uh, which Grace Cottage has maintained. So it has been trending downward and projected for fiscal year 24 is only slightly above one. They are projecting a slight increase for 2025. Um, and while this is good, the lack of funded depreciation may be a concern especially if the plant, the age of plant is high. Um, and next slide. So speaking of age of plant, um, it's hovering right around the 75th percentile, so it could be helpful to have some of that um, unrestricted funded depreciation. For capital expenses, Grace Cottage is primarily focused on IT improvements and the construction of their new rural health clinic. And next slide. Turning to long-term debt decapitalization, it does seem to be trending upward, so it is still relatively low. Um, and then for the debt service coverage ratio, we see that they have not hit the standard minimum ratio for lenders for a few years now. And um, since Grace Cottage has had negative operating margins historically, they're income wouldn't be able to cover that obligation. Um, in 2025, they're hoping to budget some positive margin. And next slide. Summary of financial health. Um, let's read this slide. Margins are negative and consistently worse than budgeted. Days cash on hand has dropped below 100 days in the last two years. Days in patient account receivable has average performance. Current ratio is dropping closer to one and there's no unrestricted funded depreciation. Age of plant is high, right about the 75th percentile. Uh, Long-term debt decapitalization is climbing, but still low overall. And debt service coverage ratio is negative and does not meet the standard minimum ratio for lenders. Oh, next slide. Um, but Grace Cottage performs too few inpatient services to have their inpatient numbers included. So there are only outpatient numbers. They seem average to high as Vermont overall has high outpatient prices. The lower relative price compared to standardized price, standardized price indicates price may be reimbursed better for Medicare patients, which um, is pretty common for critical access hospitals. And next slide. So what did they assume for Medicare slash Medicaid price reimbursement increase or price slash reimbursement increase? Uh, from the narrative, Medicare as a critical access hospital and rural health clinic, Medicare reimbursement is ultimately based on just under actual cost of providing care to those patients. And from the narrative for Medicaid, Reimbursement is all based on fee schedules set by the state of Vermont, of which Grace Cottage has no control over. Uh, and from the workbook, it is a 5% increase for Medicare and 0% for Medicaid. And we can jump to the next slide. Okay, um, so Grace Cottage has requested an NPR increase of 12%, according to their workbook. 6% will come from increased volume. Um, and then looking at their changes in volume, uh, we see a 25%, 5.8% increase in Medicaid. Medicare 
traditional is um, creeping up at just about 1.3%. And then Medicare Advantage is flat. And commercial, we're seeing a um, moderate increase of 8%. And we can go to the next slide. So commercial projected versus actual NPR has been um, pretty spot on. So kudos to your modeling. Uh, public payers are projected a bit high compared to actuals. 2022 was pretty close, but 2023 actuals dropped when Grace Cottage was projecting a bit of an increase. Uh, we can jump to the next slide. Uh, year over year, Grace Cottage has had NPR submitted requests reduced in 2020, 2021, and in 2022, 23, and 24, they were approved. Um, historically, NPR has come in lower than budgeted with the exception of 2022. Uh, Grace Cottage has reduced their operating expense in 2021 in the approved budget, and their requested and approved are equal for all other years. Actuals have come in higher with the exception of 2020. And then last, projected margin has dropped from budgeted in 2020 and 2022. Um, budgeted and approved have been equal for 21 and 23. Historically, operating that margin actuals have come in higher for 2020 and 2021 and lower in 2022 and 2023. And then the next slide. So this is just to convey that Grace Cottage is unique in sharing an HS health service area with another hospital. Um, however, Brattleboro is an acute care hospital. Grace Cottage is critical access, meaning they treat a smaller rural community that would otherwise go underserved. And we can move to the next slide. Um, here we have efficiency, uh, clinical productivity. The data wasn't required. Cost is above all comparator groups for the average inpatient cost for Medicare discharge from 2018 to 2022. For revenue, compound annual growth rate of NPR per adjusted discharge from 2018 to 22 is 7.03% compared to the critical access rate total of 4.35% and the critical access hospital national median of 5.66%. Um, the admin to clinical salary ratio is notably higher than other Vermont critical access hospitals and the Vermont median. And their case mix index is lowest in the state. All right, and next slide. And I will end it there. Thank you. Thanks, Janelle. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Vigario. Am I correct? That was your first time presenting to the board? Yeah, yeah. Nice. Well done. Thank you. That was great. Um, I will read the motion into the record and we'll see if there's a second. Um, I move to approve Grace Cottage Hospital's budget with modifications as follows. With fiscal year 25 NPR approved at a growth rate of not more than 6% over its fiscal year 24 approved budget reduced from 12% and a commensurate reduction in operating expenses. With fiscal year 25 commercial change in charge, a negotiated rate growth capped at 3.4% over the fiscal year 24 approved commercial rate cap with no commercial rate increase for any payer uh, exceeding that amount and subject to all other standard budget conditions as approved by this board. A second. Board member questions or comments? Um, I have none myself, although there's a lot of information today, so I, I'm going to go back through some of this and I may follow up with staff offline on a couple of points for, for Grace because I actually wasn't as deep on Grace as I was on some of the others. So I, I might connect with you guys later, so thank you. 
Um, I'll turn to the HCA. Nothing from us, Chair. Thanks. And public comment. Okay, seeing none. Um, I just want to check the time in our schedule. We have Gifford, North Country, and Mount Scutney. Ms. Barby, how long would your team like to go? I, I think we'll need to take a lunch break. We're not going to finish all these before a reasonable lunch break. Do you want to do another one and then come back? Um, we can do, yeah, let's do one more and then we can take a break. Does that sound okay for folks? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. I think we have um, Gifford was the next presentation from staff. Yes. I believe Noah is going to lead us on that one. So I will turn it over to Noah. Thanks, Janelle. That and is correct. I I want to say, I think Noah and Emma are also first time. So we have a lot of new faces <laughs> and I'm just thankful for all of their help getting through this massive deck. But I'm going to go. correct you, Ms. Barabee, second time, because I believe Emma and Noah presented uh, on Wednesday. Oh, with public technically, yes. Yes, that's right. They read public comments. Thank you. OK, <laughs> but they were but they were acting as others. So this is their first time as themselves. Yeah, whole, whole team of rookies. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you. Um, okay, yeah, thank you, Elena. Thank you, Owen. Um, I'll be presenting on Gifford to get today. Again, this is Hospital 5 of 7 on today's schedule. Um, looking at this slide, we see the three core components of a hospital budget request. Um, it looks like Gifford came in substantially over both on their NPR request and their commercial rate request. Um, these individually comprise a small amount of the percentage of the system over guidance, a 2% and 3% respectively, or 66 million and 2.3 million. Next slide. So again, Gifford uh, justified their requests with three core justifications. These are not comprehensive. Um, they were lifted from their budget narrative and from the budget hearing. Um, the first is that they need to meet their debt covenants, that they have somewhat poor financial health. In their narrative, they wrote, cash continues to erode, which has not only resulted in the substantial draw on our reserves, but has also reduced our current standing with our lending institution. If current trends continue, Gifford risks returning to technical default on our bond. Um, we'll get into this later as we discuss the financial health slides. A second justification, uh, they need to undertake capital repairs and improvements. In their narrative, they write, in addition to supporting operations, the requested rate will permit us, GMC, to undertake much needed deferred capital repairs and improvements. Again, we'll see this later when we look at the age of plant slide in the financial metrics section. And their third and final reason, which I think is quite substantial here, is that um, they've made E, uh, EHR, EMR improvements that's that have really affected their revenues over the past couple of years. And particularly, they think that these improvements will increase their NPR naturally. Uh, they argue that it'll enable them to improve their charge capture and denials management. For this reason, their, and I'm quoting here, collection rates improve beyond the projected budgeted projections for FY 2024. This yielded a budget to budget increase in NPR of 4.7%. This increase was before any applicable price increases. And that's from page four of their narrative. Uh, next slide. Those were the three justifications. Keep those in mind as we go through the remaining slides. Um, first, to dive into their revenue trends. Um, it looks like their public payer revenues have been relatively steady over time, um, particularly from Medicaid whereas their commercial revenues have increased quite substantially since um, their 2023 actuals. At least they're projected to increase substantially um, this year and then in next year's budget. Next slide. Um, again, this can be a bit confusing with the colors, but as a reminder, um, the red negative values convey when actuals were under what was budgeted. The black values convey when actuals were over what was budgeted. Um, we see uh, some variation here. 
Um, hold on, let me pull up my notes. Um, no real consistent pattern. Uh, sometimes they're over, sometimes they're under. Um, mostly, I think, by smaller margins than other hospitals. Uh, the standout seems to be they're consistently over budgeting for commercial insurance. We've seen that every single year from FY 2018 to FY 23. And um, they under budgeted in FY 23. And for FY23, this was partially due to um, problems with their EMR, which I'll explain later. Next slide. This graph shows their change in charge over the years. Against this, again, this is the change in charge per each year. It's not cumulative. And um, the cumulative change in NPR over the years. Um, so we've seen charges somewhere between 3 and 4%. Um, but decreasing in this year's budget. And then we've seen NPR um, actually sort of slide um, FY 2021 in the following years and project to jump this year and in next year's budget. Next slide. Uh, delving into their expense trends, um, it looks like their year-over-year uh, -year expense growth has been lower than the Vermont average uh, consistently year over year. Uh, if we go to the right and we try to break down their expenses, they provided um, a good amount of detail here. Again, to answer uh, Dr. Merman's question from earlier, the hospitals report in slightly different ways, but you can sort of distinguish these general trends. Um, their labor expenses have increased substantially since 2023 and are projected to increase, well, about 6%. Um, again, this aligns with a system-wide trend generally as hospitals are extending more benefits to their staff and trying to um, hire full-time staff to replace travelers and contracted labor. Next slide. Um, so here in the slide, we're zooming into FY 2024 to FY25, and we're looking at any additional staff that they're adding on. Um, they're adding nine full-time staff members this year, but eight will be clinical FTE. Again, mostly to deal with traveler expenses. Um, they've noted that they've had particular trouble following two contracted positions in particular, and this is um, a considerable area of risk for their budget. I think they've uh, designated it about $600,000 um, worth of risk. Next slide. This displays their operating margins. Um, they've suffered for a variety of reasons. Uh, the key reason was the implementation of their new EMR system, um, which was uh, slow, slow going and uh, difficult for a variety of reasons. Um, and substantially depleted uh, their potential revenues. Um, they suffered from this in FY23 as well as FY24. They also cited a $1.3 million shortfall in expected Medicaid reimbursements, which if you see the quantitative value of um, the negative operating margins is quite substantial. It makes up about half of the negative margin in FY24. Next slide. Um, so now we're going to start to discuss their financial health. Again, along with their EMR problems, um, poor financial health is a core reason for their budget request. Um, you see in uh, FY23, they uh, suffered in all three uh, metrics cited here. Uh, again, mostly due to a uh, flawed EMR rollout. And then in FY24, uh, their operating margin was uh, substantially negative, and they barely came in, broke even in their total margin at 0.0%. Um, if given this year's budget, they'll have a much more comfortable margin um, between 4 and 5%. Next slide. Um, so here on the left-hand side, we have uh, days cash on hand. On the right-hand side, we have a patient's account receivable, which is how quickly they can um, reap payments from their services. Um, on the left, uh, we say days cash on hand depleting rather quickly. Um, it's almost below the minimum recommended level. Uh, that's from a high of 
about three times that just a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, the PAR used to be quite poor, but like other hospitals, is improving pretty quickly. And I suspect the EMR might have um, something to play with that, but I'm, I'm not quite sure. Um, next slide. This displays their current ratio, um, both uh, including funded depreciation and excluding funded depreciation. Um, on the left, you see they're slightly above the median, but when you exclude funded depreciation, um, their numbers are a little more conserving. They're approaching uh, break even levels. Next slide. Um, this is their age of plant. As a reminder, this was their third justification for their budget. It was the EMR system, poor financial health, and aging infrastructure that required investment. And um, this data more or less substantiates that request. Um, their age of plant is high um, and is slowly increasing. Um, it's above the 75th percentile, which is 14.63 years. Next slide. Uh, these are the last two financial metrics, long-term debt to capitalization and debt service coverage ratio. Again, if you can sort of split the slide in your mind, um, the slide on the left, uh, in the slide on the, in the graph on the left, lower values are better or preferable. And on the graph on the right, higher values are better or preferable. Um, so their long-term debt to capitalization is actually quite low. The graph is a little bit misleading in the way it's constructed, but um, you'd want to see at most a hospital be around 50%, lower than 50%, and we see their long-term debt to capitalization decreasing to about 15%. Um, their debt service coverage ratio was very concerning in 2023 and 2024. It was negative in 2023, um, under the minimum, minimum ratio line for render, lenders in 2024. Um, this is something they explicitly cited in their budget. Um, if given their budget, it'll be much healthier um, between four and six. Next slide. Um, so to summarize their financial health, I think the theme is that there's some um, concern here uh, in their margins. They've really struggled in FY23 and FY2024. Their day's cash on hand has dropped significantly since 2022. Um, their age of plant is above the 75th percentile. Their infrastructure is uh, on the older end of the spectrum. Um, their PAR has improved from poor to average, which is promising. Um, current ratio is typically above one with unrestricted fund depreciation. Um, Long-term debt to capitalization, low, nothing to be concerned about. And debt service coverage ratio, um, with the exception of 2023 and 2024, is quite high, but um, they were um, in a treacherous territory there for a couple of years. Next slide. Okay, so going into RAND prices, Again, should be familiar for the board. Um, we'll start on the right side, which is um, the best metric of their aggregate price level. Um, and we see something common with a lot of Vermont hospitals, which is higher outpatient prices than inpatient prices. Outpatient prices are quite high. Inpatient prices are a bit on the lower end. Um, if you move your eyes leftward to relative price, you see they're much lower. And again, this is because likely because they uh, receive more favorable reimbursements from Medicare um, because they're a critical access hospital. Next slide. Okay, um, now to discuss their budget assumptions. Um, again, they didn't uh, specify uh, a Medicare assumption in their narrative. Um, but from their workbook, we lifted that they're expecting a 0% rate increase from Medicare and a 0% rate increase from Medicaid. Again, that's from the data that they submitted us um, and we've worked over with them in their workbook. And next slide. On their volume assumptions, on the left, you see payer mix. Um, this hospital is mostly uh, earns its revenues from commercial payers, around 61%. Um, a smaller amount from Medicare, about 33%, and a very small amount from Medicaid, only about 6%. Um, on the right, you see some interesting data, um, which suggests they're projecting their volume to decrease 
um, quite substantially this year, um, particularly among Medicare patients, um, and only a slight increase in commercial pay payments. And this all else equal would have a depressing effect on their NPR. Um, so reading from the bottom of the slide, Gifford requested an NPR increase of 8.2%. According to their workbook, a negative amount would actually come from increased volume. Next slide. Um, this is uh, projected to actual commercial and public payer revenue. Again, take this data with a big grain of salt. Um, it's from several years ago, 2023, we made the adjustment. Um, there's a little um, point of concern here, which is in underestimation of public payer revenue, which would lead to an over request of a commercial rate increase. Um, but again, there's not enough here to draw a strong conclusion uh, to that fact. Just a, a point for concern and something to think about going forward. Next slide. Okay, here we have uh, their budget history over the last few years. Again, these graphs are small, but I can summarize them for you all. Um, largely, Giffords received their requests. Um, they've actually had their NPR and FPP approved every single year with the exception of 2020. Um, they've also had their operating expenses approved. Um, operating expenses have exceeded approved amounts pretty much every year. Um, and last, their requested and approved margins have been equal. Um, actual margins have been uh, variable compared to what's been approved, both above and below. Next slide. Okay, our final slide is on efficiency. Again, this is a aggregation of a lot of metrics that we collected. Um, the first metric, clinical productivity, is from the hospital itself. From their workbook data, they cited 19 clinical FTEs in their productivity data. 10.5% um, of these were below the 25th percentile. 30% were below the 50th percentile, which on its own is very promising. But again, this is just a subset of their entire staff. Um, we can dig into that later and hopefully expand the sample for next year. If you're curious about um, specific productivity by department, um, I'd refer you to the workbook. Um, which is now public record on the website. Um, the rest of the metrics we lifted from Nash P. Um, they suggest that they're um, relatively low cost for Medicare. Their inpatient cost for Medicare discharge is lower than their peer group, but about average for Vermont hospitals. Um, their uh, NPR growth is low year over year compared to both state and national benchmarks. Again, though, this is probably impacted by uh, poor performance in FY23 and FY24, mostly driven by a really uh, problematic EMR rollout. Um, their admin to clinical ratio, relatively stable um, until the ratio uh, jumped pretty significantly in 2022, another um, point of concern. And then uh, direct patient care FTEs higher than the peer group. And finally, just as a reminder for the board, um, on the right hand side, you see there are three core justifications for these uh, for their budget requests. Um, their EMR, their need to meet their debt covenant and need to undertake uh, capital repairs. And with that, I'll pass it off to Owen or Elena if you and uh, be happy to answer any questions you all have. One quick one from me, if you can turn to slide 128 and 129. And this is something that we can discuss later, um, but I just wanted to flag it. So the utilization, so the rate increase request is 6.8% for Gifford, and they're anticipating a negative 5.3% impact to NPR based on utilization. Am I understanding that correct? Yes. Yes. Um, all right, we can do the math later, but uh, I'd be curious if you if that math works. This is all from their workbook. So what we've asked hospitals to do is take their NPR by inpatient, outpatient, 
professional and in total and break out the NPR change due to price, due to volume, or due to payer mix shifts. So that's where these data come from. We have the dollar figures estimated by hospitals as to what that is expected to be. Okay. Um, so that's all on the web, um, but we're happy to pull it up if that's useful. No, that's fine. So this is Gifford's data though. This is, yes, mm -hmm. this that's is fine. hospital reported data. Okay, um, can you go back to the motion slide? Um, I move to approve Gifford's budget with modifications as follows. With fiscal year 25 MPR approved at a growth rate of not more than 3.5% over its fiscal year 24 approved budget, reduced from 8.2%, and a commensurate reduction in operating expenses. Two, with a fiscal year 25 commercial change in charge and negotiated rate growth capped at 3.4% over the fiscal year 24 approved commercial rate cap, reduced from 6.8%, with no commercial rate increase for any payer exceeding that amount and subject to all other standard budget conditions as approved by this board. I'll second. And any other board member comment or questions for staff? I had a question um, because in looking at their and. PR, the recommended NPR at guidance compared to their projection, they're 8% below what they would be with the recommended amount. And maybe some of that, especially given the negative 5% volume, um, it, I'm just wondering how, if we think that's realistic, um, maybe because of the EMR issues that I think is, a for me, it's hard to kind of factor that in, in terms of how they may be projected. If that five negative 5% is real, maybe they put too much in the EMR bucket versus volume bucket. I don't know. So I'll, I'll just ask you to think about the projection being so much under budget, which again, may be EMR related. And so maybe that shouldn't be as much a concern as it otherwise would be. Uh, this is Tom. Um, I'm also having um, I question the minus five point through three and the volume going down and the resulting numbers that come out. so i'm I'm struggling to understand, are we to take the numbers that they provided us um, as being and do we do staff believe those to be? an accurate prediction or suspect that it will turn out to be accurate or should we have some degree of skepticism about that number i don't quite understand owen asked if if the math works i'm not understanding how the math could work i think there um I think there you, we'd have to go through the workbook in detail for me to explain that, but there is math and it's there and we can walk through that. I think um, the, perhaps the 6.8% uh, the price request was intended to offset that volume decrease. And so I think you have to think about this as a whole budget, right? You, we're solving for X, um, mm -hmm. not just as Mm -hmm. you know, piecemeal. So um, I can walk you through the math that they shared with us, if that's useful. I mean, the, I if that is helpful to folks. I think in terms of what's predicting the future and how well Gifford is predicting the future, I think you'd have to have them explain that to you and justify that, right? Like I'm not, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what volume is gonna come their way or not. Um, I can't predict that for any hospital, but what we can look at 
our trends. And I think we understand that that is a community that has seen decrease in volume over time. So I think that is a reasonable assumption. I think the question is um, kind of whether they can keep it going with continued price increases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could we go to the slide of um, budgeted versus actual since 2018? Can you tell me what number I I'm my brain is kind of mushy. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I can I'm skip not, around, but, but I'm not sure either. But if it's versus, going, we have a lot of budgeted versus actual. Is there for which um, metric? Elena, it's one sixteen. Okay, keep going. All right, thank you. By payers is what you're looking for. Yeah. And it looks like they're, whether it's red or black, the percent that they are over or under is quite large. Yeah. I've seen 33%, 14%, 11%. Um, it's gotten better in 22 and 23, except for the Medicare 49% in 22. Is that a reasonable interpretation? Yeah, that's right. So the, um, right. yeah. All right, thank you. Can I just ask, that raised a question for me. Does, do we know if in 21 and 22 that that would include like the Medicare relief funds? Like could um, that be partially why it's so off? Matt, this is just NPR, right? So I'm not sure if that would show up here. Yeah, probably not. Up here. Yeah, I don't think it would. Yeah. Let me let me confirm that for you though. Okay. Yeah, just 21 and 22 were confusing in general because of all the lack of clarity on what was going to happen with rebound from COVID. Yeah. Order lunch. I I think it does include. I think it I think it does include that, but I do want to confirm. So thank you. Any other board member question or comment? Can I just Robin, just can I, I just want to clarify I understand what you just what you were asking earlier is that you're saying that their projected actuals are eight percent below budget for the current fiscal year I what I was that. what I was saying was in 2020 and 21 and 22 what I remember is there is a lot of uncertainty about what federal funds were coming in because of the COVID and repaying Medicare and the volume assumptions were all over the place. And so, and I remember this from the hearings. Uh, so I think when I saw the 44 and 49, my question was, is it possible that they didn't budget for Medicare relief funds that they then got, which then would make it way off, right? No, I, I'm actually asking about your initial question oh. regarding the, um, Net patient revenue budget. Oh, I think oh. you were saying something about that previously their actuals, their actuals coming in now are, are I thought you said eight percent less than budgeted. I don't have those charts right in front of me. And that you eight, were I yeah. think you were concerned that even the 3.5% NPR rate might what I my impression of what you were suggesting is that the 3.5% NPR growth rate may be higher than they actually could achieve given their low utilization. Is that what you were yeah. trying to say? Yes. Yeah. So, or, or that's sort of the supposition that I'm asking. So I, what I looked at was their 24 projected compared to the, the recommendation. So projected versus the fiscal year 25 NPR recommendation of 3.5 is an 8% gap because their current projection is under budget by kind of a lot. So 
uh, you know, it's like what we've seen in the past with some of the smaller hospitals is when you approve a, an increase over projected that's substantial, the expenses get built to that number. And then you're sort of building in essentially a loss. Because if you think that the NPR isn't achievable, but the expenses will get set at that amount, and then that's more certain than the, than the volume, for example, you could end up kind of unintentionally building in a loss to the budget. So that's what my question was about, is do we think it's, and it, again, if we're expecting, I have to go back and look at my notes, but if we're expecting the EMR stuff to be corrected and bring in a lot more sort of money than what you would expect given the volume, then that makes sense that there would be that bigger gap. Yep. Thanks for that clarification. Certainly, hopefully the executive team and board of the hospital would flag and address that kind of issue. Um, any other board member questions or comments? Healthcare advocate? Nothing from us, thanks. Okay, and I'll open up to public comment via raise the hand. Um, Ms. Holland? Um, Hello, thank you. Um, yeah. First of all, let me introduce myself. Um, I'm Cheyenne Holland. I'm the new CFO at Gifford Healthcare, and this marks the last day of my third week on the job. Um, so welcome. I am not, for those of you who don't knew, know me, I'm not new to Vermont Healthcare. I was um, at Central Vermont for 18 years, 11 as their CFO, and the last six years I've spent uh, doing healthcare, um, financial and operational performance improvement um, consulting nationally. Um, and I've returned to my roots to come back to Gifford uh, and um, had a few things I wanted to, to address the board. Um, I was not involved in the detailed submission of the budget, so cannot speak to the details behind it, but I wanted to speak to my initial assessment of Gifford and their budgetary needs. Um, I think in their presentation, they ex uh, this Dan and the interim CFO bill spoke to the fact that Gifford Healthcare comprises of Gifford Medical Center, the hospital, which is under purview of this committee um, and of this board and review. It also has Gif Gifford Healthcare, which is the parent and the federally qualified health center, and Gifford Retirement Community, community which includes long-term care and an independent living facility. These entities combined constitute the Gifford obligated group for debt purposes. Um, so we look at them in its entirety, not in each individual entity for, for debt purposes. Um, on a consolidated basis in fiscal year 23, Gifford Healthcare ended the year with an operating loss of $14 million. Um, as a result, we had a technical default um, with our debt and we are currently un operating under a debt covenant waiver with our um, debt holders. We um, must meet our original debt covenants by the end of fiscal year 24 and must have a budget in place to ensure compliance in fiscal year 25. We are currently projecting as a system as a whole in, uh, through the end of July 31st, we're projecting out to the end, year end of a $5.5 million loss in 24. And essentially our budget is break even for fiscal year 25. With the hospital, you know, with some components having a little bit better performance and some having a little worse uh, performance. The two covenants that we failed at the end of 24, uh, end of 23 that are under watch are our debt service coverage ratio, which um, in 24 was, ne was negative. And we are projecting to meet our covenant. The covenant is 1.4, and we are projecting on a consolidated basis of achieving 1.7. However, the one that's of concern is our day's cash on hand. Our days cash on hand covenant is 75 days and on a combined basis as of July 31st, we are currently at 70. We anticipate meeting our covenant um, at year end and 
with an EMR conversion, we know, and we've seen other hospitals, and we've seen this, and I've seen this nationally, that AR slows down, cash gets tied up, and then as things process, it starts to relieve. We also received uh, extraordinary financial, um, uh, the EFR extraordinary financial relief for our long-term care facility. We were just awarded that. We expect cash to come in for that in September. And so between the the two with days cash on hand, um, AR performing better uh, than when we first went live on the EMR and that relief fund, we expect to hit our debt covenant. So we will not be in a default um, in 24, but we are under watch. We um, were unable because of this, we we're, were unable, you know, I, I watched the, the presentation. We have low debt, you know, debt to capitalization uh, because of our performance, we're unable to secure a line of credit to help us through our EMR conversion and when cash was dried up and we had to really uh, look uh, and release a lot of our financial and cash reserves. Looking at the data that staff has provided and looking at, as I said, this is only week three, so this is gulping from a fire hose at this point, but Gifford has shown a history of making very modest requests and staying within the board's budgeted guidance. Um, we're currently in a stabilization mode post EMR and post loss. We're pulling many levers across our organization in order to make the necessary improvements, including looking for other funding sources, you know, within the long-term care, such as the EFRs, um, the FQHC, looking for grant funding, any any funding source available, we are, are looking to, so it's not all going to fall on to the burden of the ratepayers. We're looking to also um, expand access in the primary care uh, primary care in our FQHC, make sure our schedules are, are where they need to be, and we are looking at expense control across the organization in all areas. Our 